Right, hello everyone, and welcome to the politics of Skyrim Civil War, Skyrim Civil War. Um, and this is a special thanks to um, Nathan Hood, who um, really set the ball uh, rolling for, for some something like this. Uh, it was on one of his um, streams. Uh, we, we, um, uh, we, a few of us in chat, including one of our guests here, I'll introduce in a second, uh, sort of started conversation around this and it uh, sort of went on from there. Um, unfortunately, Columba couldn't uh, couldn't make it uh, this this afternoon, this evening, but um, not to worry. We should um, it should be a great sort of um, you know, stream. Uh, it's going to get very sweaty, I think, but uh, <laughs> um, it should be great. Uh, so, of course, we are joined by uh, Apostolic Majesty. Um, good evening, sir. How are you doing? Hello, Al. I'm fine. Thank you for having me on. Yes, the, the last one standing, so to speak, um, as per the original conception of the stream, but nevertheless looking forward to it. No, that's great. Um, and um, yes, unfortunately, I think I've, <laughs> I think I've I've um, I've sort of overanalyzed events before and after or, or around the Civil War to an extent where I've I've gone to a, a and this is is really interesting with Elder Scrolls lore. You can you can sort of go into the most like um, <laughs> over the top detail where you're actually just looking into the nature of Akatosh and and Oriel and Shazar and and you know, is Shazar and Akatosh the same you know, the face of the same coin um, and does does that has that determine the relationship between man and elf? Um, it's sort of like. <laughs> <laughs> looking at today um but i've had to sort of control myself with um uh what i've put in for the uh the powerpoints today um but um yes yeah, so... uh, yes just 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 to uh put it out there i'm afraid when it comes to any sort of additional reading material or anything pertaining to the law i'm completely bereft of additional information all of my knowledge per this stream is coming from the mainstream elder scrolls game so Morrowind, Oblivion, and of course Skyrim. No, that's great. And um, and um, obviously, Apostolic Majesty, Apostolic Majesty, please do check out his channel. Um, he does um a sort of a, a, a historical podcast uh, series with with Columba and uh, guests and and friends of the channel. Um, and um, the. What what we would like to do is um, in in the sort in the game of Skyrim and and around the Civil War itself, there there are many comparisons to um, um, events that happened in history in in our in you know in uh, in real life, and um, it will be interesting to see if there's any you know going through this that it, you know AM and we we can talk about some real world inspiration. Um, because I, I think um, one of the interesting things, I, I, um, before we get into it, is um, that um, th there, with with the online right, there was. Um, I remember even back in the day, there was a very strong uh, <laughs> um, affection towards the Stormcloaks um, because of their, um, I, I guess, the sort of pursuit. Or, or in the minds of the people supporting them, the pursuit of a sort of ethno ethno state, um, and um, it, I, I always find that one quite an interesting one. Um, bearing in mind when we when we find we we sort of find out a, an interesting dossier um, going forward. Um, I don't know. What do you think about that? Am the the sort of um, I remember people like uh, Laura Towler. Yeah, one, one when I first did my first Elder Scrolls stream, who um, people who don't know who Laura Tower is, she's um, a member, well, a member of um, British Alternative, and she was um, like quote tweeting about you know when I was talking about just just talking about Skyrim, she was talking about the uh, sort of sort of going on about the sort of ethno states or uh, political um, aspect of the game uh, and why that she, you know. Um, they they have sort of a keen interest, let's say. As to why people like Laura Tala have a interest in the uh, um, in the Stormcloaks, <laughs> I don't quite know why. I mean, there isn't really enough depth in the game to explain as to why 
um, you know, the storm cloaks would be so appealing, other than the fact that they're fighting indirectly against their nominal oppressors, the Thalmor from the Eldermary Dominion. Um, but then, of course, if you're looking at it from that angle, you're also weakening the fabric of men as a whole, undermining that in the mm. face of a greater power. So if you're going to <laughs> use that sort of <laughs> logic, it could be used against you. Um, and, I mean, it, that barely sort of comes across in the game. I mean, you have the internal political situation in Windhelm, which is the capital of the Eastern Holds under Ulfric Stormcloak. But mm -hmm. even that, I mean, <laughs> the extent of sort of ethno-nationalism you have in the game is is quite tame. It's a, uh, what is it? There's a character called Rolf who goes around at night shouting in the so-called gray corner saying, go back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the funny thing with the ethno-nationalist point is that, as you mentioned, in, 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 um, in the uh, Windhelm, you, you have um, what is it? You you have the Grey Quarter, and then you have the Argonians working on the docks, um, and the 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 I mean the the Dark Elves were relatively new, but the Argonians have sort of been um, yeah they they've been sort of around Windhelm for quite some time, and um, and and of course you have the East you you have um, the East Empire Train Company, which has this base, its, it's main HQ is in Solitude, but it has like a an, you know, an outpost in um, in in um, Windhelm as well. Um, yes, I always thought that was a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, I'm also not sure what the time frame exactly is on the Dark Elves coming into Windhelm, uh, because the as far as I'm aware, the eruption of Red Mountain, which destroys the continent of Vardenfell, Vardenfell yeah. which is one of the main mm. uh, strongholds of Morrowind, and that's where the Dark Elves, of course, come from, happens some 200 years, I think, before the, uh, the events of Skyrim. So I would have thought that this uh, ongoing refugee crisis would have been settled a long time ago. And I also would have thought that having indigenous or not necessarily indigenous Argonian dock workers wouldn't have necessarily caused friction between the Argonian Argonians and the Nords as much as it will cause friction between the Argonians and the Dark Elves due to their <laughs> recent history, so to speak. So it's quite yeah. interesting that within the uh, the politics of that, it's actually the Argonians and the Dark Elves are on side, when if anything, I would have thought if I were Ulfric Stormcloak and I were wanting to control the situation, I'll be playing off both factions against each other. Well, because he could do that in theory, because uh, one of the things um, that's mentioned in, in one of the... Um, the after the events after as you mentioned the uh, the eruption at Red Mountain, which destroyed Vardenfell, which um, for people in 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 like previous games like Morrowind and such is quite you know it's, it's the major cities, uh, many major cities sort of uh, operate in, in that area, and of course the um, Temple of the Tribunal and what have you. So there there was um it was major part of the province, and at the same time uh, the Argonians. Uh, in in Black Marsh invaded southern um, Morrowind, mm. so you're right in that way. They definitely because they were. There's been a long back and forth between the uh, Dark Elves and the Argonians, yeah. mainly because of slavery as well. Um, which, uh, if it's um, all right, Al, I think we're you know getting a little ahead of ourselves. You mentioned before the stream. Uh, you know, events that happen prior to and getting bogged down in the law. I don't really want to do that, but if possible, no. Al, can I just talk about how we got here? What is the situation in Skyrim and in Tamriel in general? Or, you know, for people who haven't necessarily even played the games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Elder Scrolls takes place on a continent, a fantasy continent called Tamriel, which is composed, comprised of various provinces, as you can see in these maps. And each province has a uh, a, a certain race assigned to it, either a beast race like an Argonian or a Khajiit, either Mary or Elven races such as the Dark Elves, the Wood Elves or the High Elves and various other Elves which, such as the Snow Elves which are forced into the underground dwellings of the uh, the old Dwemer ruins in Skyrim. Then you have races that don't have any sort of uh, permanent stronghold like the Orcs of Orsinium. And then you have the Menish races. So you have the uh, Red Guards of Hammerfell, you have the Bretons of uh, High Rock, you have the Nords of Skyrim, and you have the Imperials of Cyrodiil. 
Now, around uh, several hundred years before the events of Skyrim, all of these provinces were united into a single empire by Talos, who later became Tiber Septim. And this empire, under his dynasty, the Septim dynasty of dragon blood emperors, those bestowed by the special gift of Akatosh, ruled over Tamriel for some 350 years, until an event in the fourth Elder Scrolls game, Oblivion, where we have the destruction of the Septim dynasty. We have the, the hordes of hell essentially invading Tamriel, uh, led by Merun's Dagon and the mythic Dawn cult under Manka Cameron. And the destruction of the Septim dynasty ensues, and then you have a long interregnum thereafter and a massive amount of political instability in one of the provinces, one of the provinces that was conquered by Cyber, uh, Tiber Septim, Alanor, or the Somerset Isles, you have a new government led by the local elves uh, called the Thalmor. And in the rest of Tamriel, uh, basically Bedlam ensues. So Morrowind breaks away. The forces of the Argonians and Black Marsh, uh, basically the lizard people, invade Morrowind and uh, uh, destroy much of the south, as you can see on that map. The Aldmeri Dominion expand into Valenwood, which is the Wood Elf province. And the, the dynasty from, I believe it's Colovia in northwestern Cyrodiil, uh, mm -hmm. called the Mead right. Dynasty, uh, takes over and uh, takes over the Elder, uh, the Elder Council and establishes a new government across Cyrodiil. And it's in this political context that we have the major backdrop for the game of Skyrim, which is the Great War which is a major conflict between the Elven forces and the Khajiit led by the Thalmor of the Aldmeri Dominion against the Imperials and basically the forces of men as part of the remains of the Cyrodelic Empire led by the Mede dynasty. And as a result of this conflict, the Elves sort of win a period of victory. They're able to take the capital of Cyrodiil, the Imperial city, but they're forced out. As a result of this, the Emperor has to, I believe, cede Hammerfell basically to become independent, though not part of the Aldmeri Dominion. And the rest of the Cyrodiilic Empire has to amend their religious setup, which abandons the worship of the founder of the Septim dynasty, the Septim Empire, Talos, who had ascended to godhood apparently after his death by achieving something called Chim. And it's into this situation that we have the Skyrim Civil War. Uh, I believe that the Norse in particular have a particular affection towards Talos, Talos of Atmora, partly because the empire really began. It, was, it wasn't in the provinces of Falkreef, uh, Old Haroldo or something, like some province, if I can remember the game from such a long uh, time Fal ago. Falkreef, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. in Falkreef Hold. Um, so Nords have a particular veneration of the, the man-god of uh, Talos. And for people who don't know, the other, the the eight, the, the Adric gods, are the gods who were tricked by Lorcan into constructing the universe, which is known as Mundus. Um, they have various, you know, qualities associated with them. But the only one who makes a, you know, a serious impression on the game really is Akatosh, mm. because of course he's related to Alduind, who is the main antagonist of the games. But nevertheless, by the time of the game, because of this central point of Talos worship, uh, the empire is basically in the centre of a major ongoing struggle. Um, the Eastern Holds have broken away and uh, declared their independence, trying to create some form of a uh, Nordic home rule in the East while in the West. There are still imperial holdouts which are loyal to the Mead dynasty. And it's into this situation that we have the political struggle, but as for the actual you know, main story of the game, it really doesn't play any role uh, in terms of how the, you know, the Ragnarok, Ragnarok rather, the, uh, the literal end of the world brought around by the, uh, the, 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 the doom eater of Sovereign Guard, uh, that doesn't really pertain to the main story beyond you know, setting up a, a temporary peace in one of the quests which uh, enables the Dragonborn to go over and uh, defeat Alduin once and for all. So yes, that's, I, I hope I've explained to some satisfaction what we're discussing today. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. Um, that's that's um, sort of very good introduction, especially people who, who have who maybe not be familiar with the game um, itself. Um, so yeah, um, Let's talk about because let's. I want to. I think because as you said, we need to really focus on the civil war. So we mentioned the Great War, and there's. Uh, if you want to watch law videos on that to understand that, that like in depth maps and which armies invaded where, there, there are YouTube videos out there. So pe people want to uh, after this video, um, go and find that and 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 uh, 
learn a bit more about that, please do, because that's very interesting in itself. Uh, but so after the white signing the white gold, um, or sorry, I should say during the the uh, the Great War itself, the in the Reach, um, because the legions were um, who were stationed there were um, were um, redeployed into Cyrodiil to fight the uh, Ultimary Dominion uh, forces during the invasions. Um, the native Reachmen um, rose up in revolt uh, and. So people who might not know, so Reachmen are not Nords, um, even though they live within the boundaries of Skyrim. They are, um, they're, they're, they're humans, but they are like a mix of Breton, Nord. Um, in the game, they are, they are considered, they are like considered Bretons in the sort of make and model. And they are described in with like Breton appearance. So we, yeah, they are Bretons, but they, it, but even the Bretons don't consider them to be fellow kinsmen. So th they're like their own sort of um, subgroup of, um, well, that sounds terrible, their own little sub race of humans. Um, well, I mean, um, in fairness to the Elder Scrolls, not all of the provinces are ever homogenous. So even in Oblivion, for example, you had an ongoing dispute in the city of Leowin over whether it was Khajiit or whether it was Imperial. No, so true. So little things like that persist throughout all of the games as to ownership yeah. over various dominions within provinces. So, for example, in mm. Morrowind, Solstheim belongs to Skyrim, and in Skyrim, uh, Solstheim belongs to Morrowind. So sometimes provinces also defect. So yes, Skyrim isn't a, you know ethnically homogenous in the sense that everyone's no. a lord, um, as we mentioned right at the beginning of the stream. There yeah. are dark elves who uh, come over from the eruption of Red Mountain and they settle west in the eastern holds of Skyrim. There are also Argonian settlers. And of course, there's a major um, imperial presence throughout Skyrim as well in terms of a administrative system, but also in the Reach province, which is uh, the main mining area in Skyrim as well, uh, where all the silver mines are located on the border of High Rock. Uh, yeah. We have a major domestic population of, as you say, Reachmen. And this is the official sort of pretext for the beginning of the Civil War, because the Reach isn't conquered by the Empire, it's conquered by the forces of Ulfric Stormcloak. Ulfric Stormcloak isn't yet the Isle of Windhelm. Uh, yeah. He takes the city, and on condition of him taking out the Reach and restoring Nordic rule in the city, um, it was on the condition that Talos worship were reinstated. Um, but then the Isle... Which, the... Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, the, which was agreed by the Isle initially. Yes, and then um, Ing uh, is it Igmund uh, yeah. betrays Ulfric Stormcloak and lets the uh, the white Hawk, uh, white gold concordat be enforced within the boundary of the Reach, and this essentially precipitates the conflict. It should also be noted that at the beginning of the game, the conflict is more or less over. Ulfric Stormcloak has been captured, and they're all going to be uh, summarily executed uh, yeah. until, interesting enough, Alduin pops along and uh, allows Ulfric Stormcloak and the various supporters he has to escape and reignite the rebellion, which of course leads one of the uh, protagonists of the main story arc to claim that this was some sort of plot uh, by the uh, by the Aldmeri Dominion to continue the civil war. So, uh, but I also think, just if it's possible, I want to talk about the terms of the White Gold Concordat, because for me, mm. it has the potential to be very, very clever, but I don't really think the game uh, is able to achieve that. Essentially, the White Gold Concordat forces the Empire, what is left of the Empire, so the provinces of High Rock, Skyrim, and Cyrodiil, into a state of somewhat submission, because it's not enough that they have to change their religion to abandon the worship of the first Talos Emperor, the first Emperor of the Septim Dynasty, uh, Talos. Uh, but they also have to allow actual agents of the Almeri Dominion to have complete impunity <laughs> and go around Skyrim uh, being incredibly sort of brazen and just asking random people, uh, do you worship this? And even I, I, they, you know, in my experience of playing the game, sometimes you don't even have to answer in the affirmative, they just attack you and kill you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, essentially, the empire is being subjugated, and it's in a state of a puppet situation. So it's not only um, about uh, a religious conflict, but it's also about re, re reobtaining sovereignty for the Manish peoples and reigniting a conflict against the elves. Now, something mm. I thought would be actually very clever 
if this came across, I'm not sure whether this comes across in any of the extended literature because I'm not familiar with it. The Mead dynasty are, of course, they're not dragonborn. They're not related to the Septim dynasty. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and my assumption would be that had the Almeri Dominion not made it so public, had they not had their agents going around and uh, eliminating everyone willy-nilly with the full stamp of imperial approval, that is really stupid to me. But the idea that the emperor would tacitly approve of the Almeri Dominion sending hidden op op operatives into Skyrim and the empire to hunt down Talus worshippers to destroy the cult of Tiber Septim in particular, I think that would be very clever because that would destroy the the founding figure of the empire as invariably a Septim ruler and allow for the Medes to reassert their legitimacy as something beyond mm. the Septims, effectively moving beyond that. But that's not the situation we have. No. Instead, instead, the empire, uh, we know from the leading figure in the army, the imperial army at the end, General Tullius, uh, seems to hate the Thalmor. They seem to be opposed to the Thalmor. They're not happy about the situation, about a submission allowing um, Thalmor agents to roam willy-nilly throughout Skyrim. Um, to me, this is the worst possible sort of interpretation, because if you're trying to bolster your nation against the Thalmor and you're trying to rebuild your nation, allowing enemy operatives to act with impunity and undermine and spark civil war within your nation seems like something you would you would you would fight regardless. You would never accept that in any peace treaty. I mean, remember um, the First World War, for example, the Red Line which prevented the Serbians uh, accepting the full ultimatum from Austria-Hungary was the idea that Austrian police would have extraterritoriality in Serbia to be able to uh, round up members of the Interior Ministry, which is exactly what happens in Skyrim yeah. when they round up members of the Blades. To me, it's something that I can't think of any historical parallel where this has ever happened when the when the you know the faction which is agreeing to it is secretly on side with the Thalmor. So if the Mead dynasty were for me on side with the Thalmor and were actually subjugating um, the various races of men, they were had their own secret agenda and they were using it to uh, get rid of Talos worship. I think that would make the game brilliant, but instead it's stupid. <laughs> it's a real shame as well because I was thinking of you know what you mentioned before. Um, what were the various influences for the Thalmor? Because there seems to be very little um, lore on them. Well, the problem for me for the Thalmor is that they seem to have two various obvious inspirations. One is National Socialist Germany. The fact mm -hmm. that you even, you know, you even hear, I think, bits in dialogue of uh, the elf occasionally saying, don't you see elven supremacy is the only truth? Um, <laughs> things like that, which aren't exactly subtle. And uh, the other, of course, in influence and uh, inspiration behind that also being the Spanish Inquisition. And I, I just want it to be known, if we're talking about historical parallels to this conflict, that the Spanish Inquisition was seldom instituted in the domains actually ruled over by the King of Spain, let alone imposed on a foreign power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, that I, I just want to mention that going forward, because it does sort of, I, I would say, diminish my appreciation of the setup that we have, because I believe it's fundamentally implausible. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to I was going to ask like from the historical point of view because I, you might I think you've just already answered it, but I was just trying to think in my mind has there ever been like a scenario where a foreign power has conquered? Let's not say an empire, but a a you know a kingdom or or some you know some something along those lines where they've um, subjugated it and 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 basically banned the the worship of 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 you know. Uh, god or a god and then sent little agents out to enforce it um no i, mean, I, I, can't, I can't think of a, unfortunately i can't think of a single example of that ever happening but even you know if i were to uh, to bring up some examples say for example when the mongols conquered russia hmm. the mongols established a system where they had their own agents and their own tributaries going around demanding taxes and tribute they demanded monetary reparations from the people they conquered but they left their local religions alone because they knew that asking both would just cause them to rise up and rebel interestingly enough in russia uh, the orthodox church actually flourished and was able to regroup under mongol suzerainty as opposed to the areas which had actually gone over to fight the mongols so this idea of demanding religious affiliation and tribute i mean if for example we take islamic 
states and we take um you know the the axiom upon which um you know, muslim states go out and conquer uh you pay the jizya you pay the tax and you or you convert essentially you don't do both <laughs> well, there was a, well with the like with the various islamic cal- like well, the, at least the first two is like the rashidun and the um umayyads there was a huge incentive not to convert for that reason alone Yes, and well, that, that's if anything is promoted further under the Abbasids. Yes. Exactly. Um, the various um, the various rulers of these dynasties they want to conquer, but they don't want to incite the conquered peoples up into consistent rebellion. So, mm-hmm. if anything, I mean, this is in Islam. You have the dominial, you have the people of the book. The idea that certain groups are religiously protected so long as they pay the jizya, so long as they pay the tax. This doesn't happen in Skyrim, and to me, it really does. I mean, mm-hmm. the idea again that you're organizing some form of <laughs> treaty whereby you allow your operatives to go through and impose a foreign religion on an mm-hmm. empire. I can't imagine any situation where that is going to be acceptable, like I said, unless there is tacit approval uh, from the higher ups to demolish the domestic culture. Uh, but sadly, that isn't the case. I mean, that would be an interesting angle if that was the case and the emperor was painted more explicitly to be a baddie as opposed to just yeah. incompetent. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I think um, I, I, we won't dwell on the, the writing and the law of it, but there are certain things where I would say it, when you look at um, the, let's say, the Colovian spirit, because as you mentioned, he's a Colovian warlord and the, these Colovian warlords, um, and people like Bronze Age, per, Bronze Age Perfect would say that these are like ma- they're mountain men in in the law. These people are mountain men. So I, in reality, if the old mode dominion were, were to basically come with him with those demands um the response i would expect with him to be like chop off the elves ears and send them back on a <laughs> send them back in an envelope or something um but yeah it, there's definitely elements of of that sort of stuff which doesn't make sense and it's out of out of character um i was going to say one thing and again yeah, this isn't um I, I, I obviously I know this isn't a comparison, but there is something that maybe you could argue, like an, and I've and I've heard this before online, like the sort of um, maybe on the aesthetic side, that the the stamping out of Talus Talus worship sort of mirrors what what happened with the Franks and the the uh, the conquest the, the the Saxon wars and, and the the Carolingians uh, empire's attempt to stamp out. Uh, uh, Saxon paganism and also the various conflicts um, against um, was it Wittekind? Yeah, Wittekind. Yeah, um, and I know that I, I've seen online, uh, even in you know, like various forums, um, people drawing comparisons with Wittekind and and Ulfric. Um and um, I mean that is interesting because, of course, both you know both Germanic you or both Nordic Germanic in nature, um, and you know both. I mean, I'm just thinking back to the Saxon Wars. How many times did Charlemagne? It was like three or four times he had to invade and yes, and, down. and uh, he escaped many times, and uh, he eventually yeah. was sort of uh, captured and defrocked eventually. But um, it took yeah. a while. I think my again my bone of contention when trying to come up again, I, I can't find. I'm afraid a completely analogous um, example here, uh, because the equivalent would be had oh. Norse Germanic paganism being the established religion of the Carolingian Empire. And had they been forced by a foreign power to accept Christianity, and they were still hostile with that power, which isn't the case. Yeah, it uh, make sense uh, anyway. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's kind of like um, I, I don't know. Had Islam being imposed on the Carolingian Empire after the Battle of Tours, say for example, it went terribly wrong, and Charles mm-hmm. Martel um, was was forced to accept a similar situation. Um, but again, this is just me going way beyond the remit of what's acceptable. I mean, when you look at other examples, when, for example, a um, take the Eastern Roman Empire, mm-hmm. when it faced off against a religiously emboldened foe, which had you know revived itself after ostensibly you know decades of uh, subjugation, we're talking about various uh, Arabic tribes. Then they reorganize and reach ascendancy under Islam. The 
Byzantines rather than repelling against this, uh, this again, foreign invader culturally under Leo the Isaurian, they begin to imitate them. So they usher in a period of iconoclasm um, to try and match the religious purity and fervor of the Muslim conquerors. Um, but even then, that is the emperor taking a decision to implement it on his own initiative, as opposed to having it imposed by the Arab conquerors. So again, it's just the fact that this is being imposed by a foreign power who is allowed to maintain his own agents. I mean, to the point where they go around and they actually destroy the center of, you know, the uh, the Imperial Counterintelligence Service in the planes. It just seems, um, I don't know, it always sort of... Um, didn't sit well with me, so to speak, because I can't rationalize a way as to how the empire would ever accept that situation unless, again, I was being <laughs> giving the script far more credit. And the emperor wanted the blades to be eliminated because the blades, as Delphine says in the uh, in the uh, the the fact of Skyrim is that they are loyal to a dragonborn. So this idea that there might be some sort of septum air somewhere, so eliminate blades, so there is no sort of uh, potential conflict of loyalties but sadly again there's nothing in the law to indicate that uh, yeah. the Titus Mead or the Thalmor are that devious no um no that that's true as well um it would it, I as I said if he was like a Palpatine-esque figure who hated he was like a secret elf or something or you know something like that that, that would I mean at least it makes sense well um, I mean they even have a story like this don't they with um is it Jager Thorn? When um, Jager Thorn takes over the throne as the imperial oh, yes. mage yeah, yeah. from yeah, that, um, Uriel Septim, that, so that this... is sorry. I, that, for people wondering, that's in the Elder Scrolls Arena. That's the first game um, um, reference there. Yes, um, yeah. So this has happened before. So it would be you know plausible, say for example, that Titus Mead was being controlled, or you know has been essentially replaced by some sort of surrogate which you know could plausibly make sense but you know unfortunately this isn't the case but i think in terms of the um so in terms of like a blanket ideology when we look at the imperials as they exist in skyrim um the imperials are they're, they're essentially just romans they're romans in terms of their dress they're romans in terms mm. of their nomenclature um however unlike the romans they allow for the domestic cultures and the domestic sort of uh, rulers to remain in place. Um, this is very much similar in moral end when after the um, the conquest by Tiber Septum, you, not only did you have uh, local houses ruling over their own parts of Morrowind, but you even had local gods who weren't, yes. of course, in any way associated. So in terms of, I mean, it's interesting really, isn't it? Because when you look at it historically, the empire has actually been you know, quite tolerant in some regards of uh, of, our, of 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 other religions. Of course, there are the you know the 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 presence of the imperial missionaries and wanting to spread the the Adric religions. And then, of course, yeah. you contrast that with what you have in the elves, and you have is, is it things like the Arcturian heresy and the uh, Maricati yeah. selectives, and you have this idea of uh, de-emphasizing manhood from the originally elvish pantheon. It's all of this sort of complication. Yeah. And, and 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 also there there is. Um, uh, an instant we have a reverse where you have a, a, a sort of there was a cult um, that tried to um, that tried to sort of de elvify the sort of um, pan the sort of Nordic pantheon. Um, uh, but I mean that's that's just that's another um, that's another story. Um, but yeah, and one thing that's interesting with Marwind in and itself is when Tiber Septon um, when because he. He didn't conquer it like the other provinces, and throughout its time, Morrowind has always been like a, a special case. It was, yes. it, it's, it's a. I think it's actually just classed as really just a client state. It's not really, but then the thing though is, it's not even a state because you have the various, as you mentioned, the houses, which operate. It, from what I can understand, it's like a, um, like a sort of oligarch um confederation i i can't that's the way i would sort of describe it but... well it's, it's an oligarchical confederation of noble houses under three gods <laughs> which is you know yeah you, like a theocratic oligarch yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but but, yeah, but I mean, one thing that was interesting was under his uh after the um after uh type steps conquest he uh, artificially created the actual kingdom of Marwind, and he yes. placed um, the House Har Har Harlu, 
um, as the title holders um, uh, from from forever after, um, as as kings, kings or, or queens of of Morrowind, um, which um, um, was quite interesting because, of course, he he um, he even had um, uh, the, I think the first queen uh, of it was the first monarch of of Marwin, which was a queen of uh, a, a, or a member of House Haru, uh, even had um, a fling with with him. And Is this uh, Queen Baron Zaya? I believe so. That's yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Um, I, I to be honest, I. D- out of all the provinces, Morrowind is the one that I mainly because it's very complex in its stru- political structure. I always struggle a bit to. Um, um, it's actually one of the most interesting. Got it's got a lot of law information on it, but yeah. it's, it's one of the hardest ones to to get into. Um, yes, I think Morrowind really is a is a triumph when it comes to the complexity of the Elder Scrolls law and creating something which mm-hmm. is truly fantastical in terms of creating a, a setting for role playing i also think unfortunately that um the bethesda have focused since morrowind on improving the the atmospheres they create the worlds they create mm. um they're very good at atmospheric storytelling but unfortunately they've uh, <laughs> i would say declined in the role playing element since morrowind unfortunately um someone in the chat is asking uh, did the romans allow local uh, cultures to be in place they did but not to the extent that we see with the provinces where you literally have local Jarls being virtually autonomous so long as they send, what was it, a couple of men to be parts of the Imperial Legion. Um, And even then, I mean, it doesn't really help that in Skyrim you seldom ever see um, Imperials who actually speak or look like Nords. They virtually all look like foreign conquerors. I'm not sure whether that's to to put a point, but they're all virtually Imperials. Um, Yes, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you have... At one point, the entirety of Tamriel unified, but you have all of these various cultures with varying degrees of autonomy, and Morrowind is the the most interesting case Mm. of all of this. And of course, there are various nations which absolutely despise the empire and want to undo its entire legacy. So, for example, the Aldmeri Dominion, um, they want to remove all sort of managed influence, and they want to reassert the dominance that the elves had. Um, it, even sort of in the Merithic era, I mean, the Merithic era literally means the era of the elves. Before yeah. we have the uh, the rising of the men and uh, what's what's her name, uh, Saint Alicia, Saint Alicia, and Colonel, yeah. Colonel Whitestrake against all of yeah. the uh, the alien rulers, for example, in Cyrodiil. And this is also something to again to Skyrim's benefit that we also have when talking about the political situation is that Skyrim was inhabited by three Merrick civilizations, the Dwemer and the snow elves of course the falmor the falmor rather not the falmor yeah. um and we see their legacy dotted across the landscape mm. but we also see that the nords were able to take over this territory under the forces of iskramor by genociding literally genociding um yeah. the we, local denizens here we because i mentioned it briefly um and you see it in game as well um what what triggered that was the because uh, um you because as you mentioned you have the nords you have the imperials and you have the bretons but before those before that they were just known as the needic or the people of atabora because there's a constant to the north of tamriel way it's called it's, it's it's now a wasteland but it was the homeland of um the atmorans who became nords and, and the bretons and the imperials and they the, because the um i believe their continent was freezing over so it caused mass migration um and of course skyrim was the first um the, the first bit of territory that or that and also um uh, uh solstheim as well uh, where you have mm-hmm. the skull the and, and the and the all makers and everything that legacy of the yeah. as more in, um um uh, religion but um you you also uh you, you had this the first major settlement was at sarthal um, where of course the snow elves uh, uh, attacked. I think it was called the it was night night of tears. Yeah. Um, and it, it, where where effectively every everyone was wiped out apart from um, Eskimo and his companions. Yeah. Yeah, and, his, and who who and they returned with yeah, with the companions and as you said committed the genocide and um, uh, and if you um, um, in the Dawnguard DLC you actually see the sort of like where the last the, the last sort of um uh hold of of the um snow elves um at the the the, the uh 
what's it called the chantry uh in in the reach yes area. there's there's one snow elf left well two but you kill one of them so well, you, you really want one them. Um, yeah. if it's possible there's just someone mentioning in the chat regarding um it because it's spurred my mind on uh talking about the province of judea well of course if you're relaying the empire as it exists in skyrim back to the situation of rome which was the obvious example one can draw mm. well of course in the roman empire you had the imperial cult members of the judeo claudian dynasty of course were deified julius caesar was deified so in that sense you could say type septum is you're very analogous to that situation an empire builder but also a literal god as conceived of by the pagan pantheon and like the roman emperors the roman emperors are adopting aspects of other religions into their pantheon so long as one is ultimately subject towards the rule of the emperor i think the one thing that distinguishes the imperial cult vis-a-vis -vis the various pantheons here is that there is only one sort of god ascendant who is the divine talos like the divine julius whereas very you know, various members of the Julio Claudian dynasty and the successive imperial dynasties were deified. Mm. Um, almost, uh, there's a famous quote by Vespasian, the first Flavian emperor, uh, upon, you know, I think it was a sarcastic comment that uh, upon his death, he said, I think I'm becoming a god, of course, referring to the fact that the Senate regularly deified yeah. their emperors. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's an interesting little angle you can draw. But I was also thinking regarding the Romans in their pantheon, the Adric pantheon, of course, the Romans inherited most of their pantheon from the Greeks. So I'm yeah. wondering, can you possibly draw some sort of, a, I don't know, Greek nationalism vis-a-vis -vis the Romans <laughs> to the Aldmeri Dominion? If, say, for example, you're looking at the Aldmeri Dominion as some sort of Greek revivalist movement, <laughs> like, which, is like to, which is trying to eliminate the Latins. But of course, as you know, that didn't happen historically. Rather, yeah. the, uh, the Romans were Greekified, not the other way around. Yeah, I I mean that that is something that um <laughs> yeah I, I, that's something I've I have thought of as well because um I, I mean if you look at this because the, the eight divine was um of course it was it was something that was created by uh, Saint Alicia um and and at, you have to remember at the time I think you mean most of um, you still had a sizable population in, in what's now Cyrodiil which was alien so it was like elves and men uh, mixed up so of course the pantheon that would be created or be formulated would 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 con would um, uh, would be a mix of elven gods but also of the sort of the needic um, gods as well and I mean the the, the core ones people like uh, Kinnereth, Kine, uh, Mara, who goes by both names in in, pan in the pantheons, and uh, then you have Oriel and Akatosh. Um, th there's yes, there there was just crossovers there, um, but yeah, I, I, de depending on um, which which books you see in in game uh, or in or the extendable like legends law, um, it's kind of accepted. Uh, I think now in law that you know, Akatosh and Oriel are the same. Uh, I know there might be there may be a few people in chat who will start sort of spurking out a bit, but um, that's sort of um, the, or, or they they represent the same uh, chieftain, let's say the sort of senior, the most senior member of 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 um, of the of the divine uh, figures. Um, but yeah, I mean. <sighs> I was just going to sort of go back to the Reachmen um, because they are an interesting people in all of this as well, um, because they they are uh, they worship the Daedra, and they are incredibly they be, they're just incredibly hostile to all their neighbours, and they 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 live in a very um, I mean I, I've described them as basically Tamriel's Taliban. Um, I think would that be a fair description? Like that sort of um because they they have never really been subjugated or conquered even going back to you know uh raymond in in the uh the second empire tried to conquer them and and it uh you, you know what even though he could win battles he didn't actually succeed um and you know even even going you know even to the point of where you get to modern day um <laughs> In or the same one day in Skyrim itself, in 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 the fourth era, that they are still a persistent group, even though they 
are under the um, uh, a new political faction um, known as the Forsworn. Yes, I mean the Forsworn literally just means you know Forsworn in the sense that that is their land and they're trying to reclaim what is rightfully theirs and their yeah. eyes, which they continuously sort of spurg out the various dialogue section of the force one that you encounter but i mean in terms of a, a an analogy that one can draw to the force one i mean the thing that immediately sort of comes to my mind is just the welsh <laughs> to be perfectly honest <laughs> the welsh and their relationship with um the english and how it took centuries for the english to uh, mm. finally not even you know conquer the welsh but just to subjugate them in many senses and the reason i say that is because the analogy you know the, the link that one can draw say for example between the bretons and um the various celtic people is pretty obvious even the name yep. breton brythonic breton of course um mm -hmm. this can of course refer to the scottish the irish the bretons themselves um the fact that even in you know breton society they're heavily divided there's a huge amount of intrigue and uh, uh city conflicts going on within breton culture which is very reminiscent say for example of the situation you have in ancient ireland where there is nominal allegiance to a universal high king but all of the mm. various regions of ireland are fundamentally separate and that of course that uh we're talking you know the pagan celts we're not talking about the christianized celts so yeah maybe you know elements like this are seeping through into the portrayal of the reachman here um but in terms of you know their, their worship of the the daedra and things like that i don't think it's ever sort of explicitly said and i think even figures like madanach um <laughs> it's quite telling isn't it that when you free madanach from prison most of the whole for force one are still hostile to you so i feel even then that the force one aren't in any way a collective entity they're just bands or tribes even sort of warring and you know with no sort of centralized leadership among themselves so yeah you know even if you look at welsh history seldom were the welsh ever sort of united under you know one powerful figure when they were united under the uh, under king llewellyn very soon after they were conquered by the english so um yeah i, I think that's one possible connection one can draw if you're looking at this within a, yeah. a nordic context and referring to skyrim as some sort of nordic equivalent i can't really find one um, mm. Partly because, again, I, to me, it seems that the Bretons are such an obvious analogy, even in terms of their name, to Celtic civilization. That and the fact they're also half Elvish as well, yeah. um, alluding to the various mystic and uh, timeless aspect that one often associates with the, uh, the Celts. Um, someone in the chat is uh, questioning my understanding of the Roman pantheon. <laughs> I was referring to the fact that the the Roman gods virtually had direct counterparts in the Greek pantheon, which is very much how one can see the Elvish and the uh, the, the Manish pantheons in Skyrim. Mm -hmm. Not the fact that they were just ripping off on each other, uh, ripping off each other, but that there were so many sort of overlaps and parallels that I think the uh, comparison is pertinent in that sense. And like yeah. I'll just refer to is you know is Oriel the same as Akatosh is Jupiter the same as Zeus it's an interesting question but there's no definitive answer no um it's just uh it's it's kind of like a self-evident thing and one thing I would say maybe my final point in the pantheon is um again what uh, the uh imperial cult uh in in the or the I guess you say eight what would go from eight to nine to eight divine again um sort of remained consistent throughout like thousands of years uh, in in the world of the Elder Scrolls. Um, obviously, that was one exception being um, Talos, where he emitted and, and then sort of uh, removed again, um, as we mentioned, the white gold concordant. But if you look at the Roman pantheon, I mean, that that uh, or the imperial cult let's say that did change um you know it, mainly because you had just the uh more gods coming in you had um uh eastern uh eastern iranian gods you had uh different cults forming um as well so i mean i mean that what well, that is interesting but that the fact that um in even in the um Imperial cult in 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 the Elder Scrolls that it, it's all remained consistent. Uh, you didn't have like um, um, offshoots, let's say. Um, I mean, I think the one exceptions would be like the 
Shazer, I think they're called like Shazerians or the, the people who are um men who like like Talos who um are effectively have like uh the spirit of Shaw or or um so sorry the spirit of of uh, Lorkin about them so they have like a natural um I, that was, I mean you mentioned about the um uh emperors uh uh, in the Roman Empire, or upon their deathbeds, would you, know, as you said, uh, or, or after death, become uh, you know, gods themselves? I mean, that that would be the uh, sort of reference in the Elder Scrolls. You usually had like these uh, uh I think um, uh, Remin, um, Remin was one. Um, I don't know about Saint Alicia, if I'm absolutely honest, um, but yeah, Remin and um, Talos. Uh, yes, this is this is yeah. for, for me. This is a law question, which, like I said, my my sole point of reference really is the game. So, if you want yeah. to talk about the intricacies of Raymond Cyrodiil, you know, that really yeah. is beyond me. I'm afraid. But yeah. it's an interesting but, but idea. I, saying, I, I just, I just, when you mentioned about the um, uh, Roman emperors, um, there, there is like um, in in the games it's, or in in the law itself, there is like a historical, not so much like a divine worship but like a uh a cult worship of like a saint let's say uh if you if we were to draw a comparison to our our world so like a um or a, a sect following a saint or something it, that was how i'd, I'd compa compare it um yes i think um one of the uh, and we're talking about oblivion here rather than skyrim yeah. i think one of the disservices that oblivion did to the elder scrolls law was basically just extrapolate christian worship christian hierarchy and christian symbolism even christian architecture and just superimpose it on the elder scrolls pantheon which um even in terms of the aspects of fate and the divine plan and things like that uh, to, to me it sat very strangely especially when i essentially believe that mankel cameron's right <laughs> <laughs> That, that, yes, that's, that, a, that's a very deeply subversive <laughs> that Lorcon was uh fundamentally the founder and uh all the other sort of uh merithic peoples are simply just trapped here <laughs> um the, the other sort of adric gods are just trapped um not through their own devising there, there isn't a moment where god decides to create the universe it's it's not like that simple i mean to, in fairness to the elder scrolls again it's interesting an interesting idea the fact that the various divine entities were tricked into uh, creating the universe and substituting it for their power mm. and uh, this of course is the canonical reason as to why unlike where we have the roman gods why the pantheon is rather strictly related to the adra the ancestors as opposed to the daedra because the daedra of course are fundamentally different in their nature and by and large they are malevolent that's the major exception of course being with the dark elves where they look upon azura in particular as being their patron goddess but even then the other gods that the dark elves accept like mafala and yeah. uh, is it Boethia uh, are again similarly mischievous and uh, not to be trusted? There, I say. Yeah. So I, th I think it'll be very odd if you include various members of the Daedra into the Adric pantheon as well, especially given the understanding that the denizens of the universe in the world have of their respective natures. It makes complete sense, for example, for the elves to venerate and worship the Adra because they have a direct link to the Adria. They essentially believe they're of the same stuff, they're of the same substance. Yes. Um, and of course, men, it makes much more sense that they worship a figure like Talos, which is one of their own. Even I think, again, to, to the benefit of uh, things like Skyrim, uh, the naming convention isn't the same. So even though you have the Imperial cult established, I think Skyrim asserts its own identity in the sense that you don't just have Kinnereth, you do have Kine, you don't just have Lorcon, you have Shaw um and various other aspects like that you know some names remain the same like akatosh uh, but even you know the idea of talos as opposed to type septim just little bits of particularism which i like within the series yeah yeah that there is um there is like a, a regional like um importance on the names um and i i was going to say some um And I forgot what. Um, yeah, actually, the, the, yes. Yeah, so the one thing I was going to say was maybe um, again with the old Mary Dominion's, uh, I guess you could say, sort of obsession of stumping up Talus worship, is, and I, I always wondered this. You you think about it. They, these are the elves themselves are very much 
um, sort of despise the the aspect that or the, the Ultima um, in particular. I can't really speak for Bosma and, and the Dark Elves because they you know, they have their own thing. But the Ultima themselves um, are very much um, despise the notion of of um, of mortality because uh, they are mortal. They're not they're not like elves in um, you know in the Tolkien universe. The the the, the, the elves in, Scar- in in the Elder Scrolls series maybe make about 200, 300 years at most. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, but they're not. Um, and you're talking about a game series that goes on for thousands upon tens of thousands of years. Yeah. Um, but the um, if you think about it, that that they're, they're sort of um, you then have Talos who comes along and he was you know, automatically um, ascended to godhood uh, as man um, might explain that because that's that must be like a real you know kick in the teeth for the ult the, for the ultima. Um, well, it's a, it's a double kick in the teeth because not only are they physically conquered by what they believed was an inferior culture. With I believe Tiber Septim was using it by using a, a monolith called the Namidian, which yeah. was a, a Dwemer war weapon to yeah. turn the tables of the elves, which had the advantage beforehand. So they feel, if, if anything, again, that they were unfairly defeated in that conflict and subjugated by an inferior culture. Yeah. And to make matters worse, they are forced to worship the figure that conquered them. I can understand I'm why like, this, this is the triple kick in the teeth. The the, um, the the core component of the Nubidium was the heart of Lorcan, yes. who they would blame as the ones that trapped them. There. <laughs> exactly. Trapped, trapped them there. So there's there's, like a, there's a lot of poetic irony revolving around that, yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. I can understand them, you know, despising Lorcan as well. So yeah. it's, inter- it's interesting to say the least. This explains the motivations for the Almeri Dominion rather well. But mm. it doesn't explain the motivations for the empire in terms of going yeah. along for this, unless you accept my non-canonical line of reasoning, <laughs> in which Titus Mead II has either been controlled by the elves or he's secretly trying to stamp out any remnant of Septim veneration. Yeah, I mean that that would be. I mean, I know that some people have made mods to sort of try and reason it away. I mean, the, my favorite one is that the the, the, the empire has been run by a cult of vampires that are turning everyone. Sort of like hypnotizing them, like in a Greek Lotus Eater style, you know. Um, I mean that that could explain it, I guess. <laughs> as one well, but there, there is one small reference to that in game, isn't there? If we're not going, you know, completely off the rails, which is talking about Sibyl Stentor and her possibly controlling hiking Torig. But again, this is yes. before the this is before the actual events of the game. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. Sibyl Stentor actually plays virtually no role whatsoever apart from assigning the hero to go off and kill some vampires. So um, yeah. that's a shame. That, that could and have she, been an interesting plot line if it was developed further. Yeah. And she doesn't really need to control Lady Elisif because you think of Lady Elisif, she, you know, she she's a, a queen that doesn't say anything, doesn't put a foot, foot wrong, doesn't do anything, mm-hmm. allows her kingdom to fall into ruin and despair, um, into... You know, um shoot like fall apart um not making i'm not going to make any reference to a um any sitting monarchs in real life um <laughs> um but um yeah she doesn't really need to control Alessa because Alessa will just do what what Alessa well, well she also has no legitimacy either because she's just she's just <laughs> yarl you're sort of she's just yarl by right of her husband there wasn't an offspring either and uh, again the genealogies um in the elder scrolls are always a bit terrible you i never really sort of understand the relationship i mean sometimes you get it explained to you like an oblivion when you understand that the uh the dynasty of coral married into the dynasty of Leowin and things like that but on the whole you don't know how all of these figures are related to one another but i think it'll be interesting to see a succession conflict going off in the the court of solitude because the jarl is not only incompetent but she has real, really no right to be there if anything i think um having a, more figures like erica in the on the imperial side would again try and explain away why they're so gun-ho about collaborating <laughs> with the Thalmor when you understand yeah. that these people just don't <laughs> care at all. They're just um, thinking about, oh, well, I'll increase my trade prospects on the Aldmeri Dominion and on the Empire side. That makes sense. But I think 
if you're looking at this from a writing point of view and you're not trying to make the storm cloaks look entirely justified <laughs> you have to just uh remove certain figures like that and just have the odd token figure like that to mm -hmm. uh, muddy the waters as opposed to the moral standing of the empire and again i think you know having talia say for example be you know an effective commander who's actually looking out for the best interests of the empire it tries to at the same time it, tr it tries to make the empire redeemable in the eyes of the player but it also makes the empire look stupid <laughs> So it's um it's an unfortunate combination really, and um this is why I think when I'm trying to understand the politics and the philosophy of the empire, I'm just at a loss because to me again it doesn't make sense, and there's no, no. historical sort of uh, example I can point to as to how a great power could ever uh, exist under these sort of situation under this uh, circumstance where they're <laughs> being uh, their entire autonomy, their sovereignty, um, and their religious practices is being controlled by another power. Um, you know, even having, I think, you know, when I'm thinking about this from the point of view of the Thalmor, because I hate to go on about this point so much, I think from the point of view of the Thalmor, having the emperor himself have to go out and stamp out Talus worship would be much better from the Thalmor's point of view, because then people would hate the emperor, they wouldn't hate the Thalmor. <laughs> yeah. You, do you know what? I, I'm going to, I will bring some real life stuff into this. I think the the mead dynasty is about i would actually say they are they they're kind of like the tory party in many ways in 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 the sort of like level of because the sort of stuff that tory party do i can imagine them doing this like if they were like in control of like a, of, of the of the empire this is the sort of stuff i can imagine them doing um <laughs> Yes, I think um, I, I would give that credence, you know, it, in terms of finding a modern example, I would agree with you. But the problem is, to me, when you finally encounter the Emperor uh, as part of the Dark Brotherhood, the Assassin's Guild uh, mission line, and you approach him, he does seem, you know, willing to face death. He does seem like a somewhat honourable figure. Um, yeah. If anything, do you remember the, uh, what is it, the, the iteration of him you see earlier, the uh, decoy version of him? Yes. Who is just, you know, LARPing it up and he's, you know, celebrating the fact he's going to get his, you know, special meal cooked for him. And, uh, you know, he's talking with all of these nameless nobles. And it's all very inane. Um, I think to me, having that be the actual Titus Mead II would be far more believable because <laughs> that's the sort of figure I can imagine selling out his country uh, yeah. in order to just, just retain the position of emperor um, yeah. as opposed to someone like the actual Titus Mead II as represented in the yeah. game. I what was quite interesting about that party when you have all the nobility and and as you said the 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 um the decoy emperor sort of like you know talking about well, like courtly they're, they're sort of like there and they're sort of like all in this um I guess you could say like you incompetent um aristocratical you know, bubble let's say um and it, it sort of reminded me because I, I remember when several months ago you had the, what was it Carlisle day and I was uh, reading. Uh, I was. I was listening to audiobooks of um, the his uh, the the French um, Carlos the French Revolution, and he was talking about the uh, the the French court at the time under Louis the the Fourteenth. And uh, I found um, I, I I do because he he's he very critical of that sort of um, um, characteristic of nobility where they they're more interested in you know, what, what, what's the latest going on in court than what's going on, you know, out there in their yeah. respective domains. Um, and, um, but even when you go to the, um, in game, when you even go to the, the, the Thalmor embassy, um, it's quite similar there in many ways. You, you have like that guy who gets drunk and makes a scene, uh, which you can exploit um, as well. Um, and, and or, or you have like, um, the Yarl of 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 uh, Morthal, yeah. who, who also like she sort of like does a bit of back chat with the other nobility, and you know there's like uh, yes, I mean if if we're going to sort of conceive of it as some sort of iteration of Davos, <laughs> um, this idea of this uh, vertical relationship that the elites, the nobility, have with each other, which is completely disconnected from any idea of representing someone else or being beholden to something else, some other power. I think the idea of, again, the empire just being stuffed with collaborators and the post-Septum empire, post-Martin, just being filled with degenerates 
um, who again are just focused on you know the quality of their wine and uh, the the quality of their you know dress etc cetera, etc cetera, and the you know various refinery and various aspects of their social life they can you know keep up I think that would be interesting but like I said if you're in a game and you're trying to make it into two into a decision and you have to try and tempt the player to go over to the other side you yeah. make it needlessly complex to the point of view it actually I think like I said it makes <laughs> I can understand the empire as a collaborationist power I can't understand the empire as a collaboration as power by accident and <laughs> wanting to sort of wrestle themselves out of the situation because like yeah. i said it is directly as a result of the empire's policy that you have the stormcloak rebellion which is entirely justified from Ulfric stormcloak's point of view because yeah. the empire has you know not only has the empire subjugated themselves to the elves who definitely don't have the empire's best interests at heart but they've also forsworn the state religion as well so the empire has lost its heart so in that sense, Ulfric is completely justified in doing what he's doing. And of course, this is why the Thalmor consider him to be an asset, because of course they want a situation like this to happen. Yeah. My only contention is, of course, it's so predictable that the Empire, of course, would know this sort of thing would happen. Even Tullius alludes to the fact that this is exactly what Thalmor wanted. So I just ask you, then why did you allow for this situation to happen in the first place? You know, even in, going back to the Great War, even fighting a guerrilla campaign and just wearing down the elves and wearing them down through attrition will be preferable to this intolerable peace because it is it's an intolerable yeah. peace it's not a peace at all it's a peace where your entire the entire sort of viability of your nation is being Dis is disintegrating around you for the sake of benefiting a party in a future conflict yeah. which they're <laughs> completely anticipating well, so what, just what, just have what, at it just fight them <laughs> rather than going through this uh, yeah. ridiculous faux peace but even during the Great War, it was, you know, the both, I mean, both the Imperial Legion itself were pretty, um, especially after the Battle of the Red Ring, which was the deciding factor in the Great War, both armies on both sides were completely decimated. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And, and, and it wasn't like there was one force that had an overwhelming victory. No. And if, if the Thalmor had an overwhelming victory, then you, yeah, that would, okay, you could probably understand it in that perspective. But that wasn't the case. No. Um, and it reminds me very much of the Tet Offensive during the Vietnam War. Um, and because one thing is very interesting, because I've taken, I've, I've, when I was younger, I was very interested in, in the Vietnam conflict because it was, um, it's quite an interesting one. But the Tet Offensive, it, it was the combination of the in, in '68, the the Viet Cong and the um, North Vietnamese Army. Um, a, a surprise attack during the uh, a, a holiday, a national holiday in um, in in Vietnam, which took uh, the Americans and the South Vietnamese by surprise. Um, but one thing that was interesting was, of course, the the attack itself. While the Americans did lose, uh, I think it was Hue City uh, around the border, um, um, the the overall offensive was a complete failure for the uh, the um, the Viet Cong and an absolute humiliating defeat by the North Vietnamese army to the point where I think it was like 75% of the Viet Cong were wiped out yeah and 50% of the North Vietnamese army was was made um, I, I effectively uh, redundant because they were either you know, killed wounded or or they ran their military supply lines were at that point just you know, completely run dry because uh, it all had been committed, and the Americans came out on top um, or at, from this offensive. And at the time, the the generals at the time were saying, "Well, we need more men now because we can." They they could have finished them off, really, but because of um, you know, because of like media and everything else, it made it. The narrative was sort of shifted that oh, actually, you know, uh, Americans, you know, American embassy on fire in in. Um, um saigon or that means you know we must be losing and so you had sort of the 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 sort of cucking from the politicians and 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 the bureaucrats sort of fearing that this was a, a war that was you know fair but it gave them then the Viet Cong the chance to rebuild and everything um but yeah i mean that that was like um again sort of you know, you're grabbing uh victory from you know the jaws of defeat and all that <laughs> I mean, someone in the uh, the chat is saying I was bluffing. Well, but even if the Thalmor were bluffing, if I were the emperor, 
I would never under any circumstances accept that peace treaty unless I was faced with mm. complete oblivion. That's the only option <laughs> one would possibly accept that peace treaty and only you would accept that peace treaty just to reorganize your forces very quickly to reignite the conflict almost immediately after because yes. you would never accept a conflict where you allow for a protracted state where an enemy power is allowed to undermine your state with impunity whilst you're trying to consolidate your forces for a, again a, re, a rematch of that conflict it doesn't make any sense from the emperor's side but it does set up the conflict where you are allowed potentially again to add a little bit of nuance in the uh, the imperial um versus stormcloak conflict another thing of course is the fact that the emperor gives away hammerfell which is a major blow to his legitimacy because even if you get rid of morrowind if you get rid of argonia uh, elsewhere um, and if you get rid of the Almeri Dominion, you still have all of the Manish races consolidated under one yeah. state. But now, when you have voluntarily ceded Hammerfell, when they make up the bulk of your army, the best warriors in your army, and they don't want to go, um, you have also, not only have you deprived yourself of a vast pool of manpower unnecessarily, but you've also destroyed your legitimacy as fighting for the fate of all men in Tamriel. <laughs> And 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 you know from the um, uh, from that uh, was it Sadie the storyline quest in um, uh, the 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 what the yes um, if, if you believe um, Kemu or whatever his name is then yes you they're still fighting the Thalmor so there's uh, no there's no reason again to believe they they have a similar situation where there are some who've gone over to the Thalmor but there are still some fighting. So there is no reason, again, to assume that there would have been enough people in Hammerfell who would have supported the Empire, remaining part of the Empire, in order to continue fighting against the Almeri Dominion. So I, I don't know. If it's possible, I think, can we just move on to the other holds? Because yeah, yeah. we're spending yeah, a lot of time let's, let's talking about the... Uh... Yeah. So uh, one thing I will say is I, I can't... I, because I'm on full screen, I can't I can't view uh, comments, people like in live chat, I'm afraid. So if I haven't like addressed anything in comments, I'm really sorry. It's just because if I was to minimize it, um, because I'm on Microsoft, it would come up with um, um, my IRL name and stuff like that. So I, I, and I, I don't know how to remove it. I have to sign out, but to do, but enough I sign out, I'll lose this. So I can't. Um, I, I won't be able to. I, I I try and bring up on my phone or something and maybe look on there. But I, people who are in chat, uh, sorry I didn't say hello, but I, I can't see you. So um yeah um but i think uh absolute majesty is able to sort of uh, pick out a few from chat um so, so yes i mean we've we've talked about a bit about you know solitude's political situation i mean markov is you know a, again a potentially good choice to talk about because you have yeah. essentially markov and rifton are parallels of each other in both cases you have a incompetent yarl which is nominally allied with opposing sides in the faction. So Igmund in Markarth is allied to the Empire and Layla in Riften is allied to uh, the Stormcloaks inexplicably, I would say. I, I don't understand why Layla, Lawgiver, would side with the Stormcloaks. I can understand why Igmund would. Um, but nevertheless, you have a situation in both holes where a powerful economically economic family controls essentially all of the vested interests within said faction. In the case of Markov, you have a situation where the Silverblood family controls the treasury, they control the prison, which is also used as a source to try and uh, control the Forsworn conspiracy, and they control all the mines as well. So for all intents and purposes, the, um, the actual imperial presence in Markov is minimal. In fact, the first thing you see upon arriving in Markov is an Imperial agent coming to the city and being murdered by an operative who is indirectly related yeah. to the essentially the manager of the Silverblood family, Thongvar Silverblood. So um, it, it's a very complicated situation you arrive in Markov with all these factions. Interestingly yeah. enough, there's only a, a tiny amount of um, you know any sort of indication of Ulfric's um you know rising there apart from a couple of comments and a couple of dialogue boxes and the fact that i think uh, one figure openly worships uh, talos within the city and you have the presence you have the natural presence of a thalmor wandering around uh, called on dolima yeah. Uh, but yes, it's a it's a very fraught uh, political situation. You're right, the Markov, and you know we talked about the the reach. Um, but 
the interesting factor about the city in particular is that the Silverblood family are trying to retain their hold over this region by controlling the nominal head of the Forsworn uprising in the city, the Reachman uprising. And as transpires in the course of your, you know, wander around the city, uh, the actual leader of this rebellion is not under control and he tries and breaks out of the city and that's of course you kill him. It's one of the better quests in the game in the sense that you actually have a control over the outcome. You can actually make decisions like a role-playing game. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and there is um I can't remember which settlement it is in the reach. There's like a a it's meant to be like a, a small mining, I guess town village um is it something at carthwaston again i have a very sort of weird memory in terms of yeah I, 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 I cannot i cannot remember it but there's um and, and this is sort of you, you think about it the that when you go to this one you have the native um reach pop because this thing um the forsworn are the um i guess say the paramilitary um sort of tribal um reachmen who are hostile attack you uh, but then you have reachmen who are just you know regular um people who you see in in when you go to markarth or the reach you see them walk you know in in the farms outside markarth and such and um um you you you'd be able to, they're identifiable because number one they're not as tall as an ord um and also they have markings like um tribal markings on their face and what have you um and you, you go to the um this this um small uh mining settlement and the natives there are having a problem because you have the uh silver bloods who are there to purchase the mine uh and they're the basically their you know their their argument is uh uh oh well you know the, we know you've been having trouble with, with the, the attacks like from the force one and everything and so i do wonder if you know the, the fact that the silver bloods were you know controlling I said, like the Forsworn um, King and and it, and its leadership um, in the prisons in Markarth, uh, they were sort of using you know, using the Forsworn to basically just p purchase land. You know, yes, they're, they're they're playing both sides, aren't they? Well, they're, they're using like false flag attacks. Yes, they're much. using they're using the Forsworn to justify consolidating their control over the region, whilst also controlling the. Um, the actual yeah. sort of antics of the force worn internally yes i mean it's ostensibly it would be an intelligent move um were madanak actually compliant and in control and of course there comes my my non-canonical line of reasoning that not in not only that but i believe the hag ravens probably have more control than actual madanak um yes because whenever you encounter a large force worn settlement is always controlled by a hag raven um, so I, I wonder, you know, that that's also an interesting aspect of their uh, particular form of worship. The, uh, yeah. the, the essentially they're led by some sort of witch esque theocracy, um, yeah, which is more interesting to me than just being controlled by Madnach. Yeah, um, the Hag Ravens play a very important role in in the Reach, um, in the, in the Reachmen. Um, I guess you could say tribal hierarchy. I mean, they're very much like. Um, I mean, going back to the Welsh, uh, the Welsh comparison, I would say they're like the Druids in many ways. Um, I mean, it's difficult to say because I mean, you rarely ever hear the Hag Ravens speak, but when you do speak to lend credibility to your point, it's when they're involved in a Briarheart ritual, um, yeah. which is you know creating uh, a, basically a forsworn leader. Um, which take out the human heart and replace him with a briar heart. Um, so in that sense, the fact that they are effectively the spiritual leaders would make sense. But uh, unfortunately, we don't see any sort of connection between the Hag Ravens and um, the Daedric cults. I, I know canonically that the Glenmoral witches who are portrayed as Hag Ravens in, the, um, in Skyrim have a connection with her scene. But um, as for the actual, you know, Hag Ravens as represented in the Reach, there aren't any sort of direct connections mm -hmm. between the Daedra. It could have been a nice little interesting touch just at one shrine. I don't know, to see, um, you know, that shrine of Molag Ball, rather yes. than having it tucked away 
um, in a random house in Markov, maybe have a inexplicable shrine of Molag Ball at one of the uh, major sort of Hagraven spots, just to cement the fact that you know they're worshiping the Daedric god of domination, maybe trying to form some sort of pact with him um, yeah. in order to gain control over the reach. That could be interesting. But again, this is yeah. just me going into uh, hypotheticals, not no. Actually, you, you've actually just pretty much i don't know if you know but um in the elder scrolls online that's um because there's a the, um before the elder scrolls online is set you had the the longhouse em, empire which was basically and the empire of, of uh this empire which was basically Cyrodiil and uh west uh, and and the reach uh, and parts of um high rock that was under the control of a um dynasty of reachmen um and uh, that that was basically you you had um you had it was it, Moloch Bao made, played a major role but also uh, Merun Stagon as well mm -hmm. um so you sort of did a prediction <laughs> there of um um something well, like that which... well hands up and hands up and say i haven't actually played um elder scrolls online so uh <laughs> th thank you but no it, it to me it, it makes more sense and i think again just little things to um maybe make again the daedric quests more relevant to the um the actual political situation in skyrim as opposed to i mean they improve them over the ones in oblivion in, in oblivion essentially every daedric uh, cult was cut off from the world you had an occasional person who knew where they were so i think skyrim improved over oblivion in the sense that the daedric cults mm -hmm. are you know they're immersive for example you go into an inn and you just have sanguine sitting there wanting a drinking contest um which again is it's quite immersive and yeah but, but again actually sort of perhaps potentially involving say for example molag bull's quest as involved in the general force form conspiracy to take back um you know markov for the reachman interesting things like that but uh, uh anything you want to sort of comment on the on the silver bloods in particular because again it's interesting that the, the jarl is basically inept and just spends his time sitting on his throne in his castle <laughs> interesting enough he has the gall to uh accuse the um what is it the the hero of being a mercenary when his entire <laughs> court and the entire city is just riven with corruption and the idea that this man has any sort of conception of honor again it's similar to what we have with uh rifton yeah. where we have I the lawgiver who yeah. <laughs> ostensibly says you know i i support you know uh, i support ulf Grig. you know i believe he is the right of it in the conflict what all the, all the meantime she's completely oblivious to the fact that her city is controlled by uh I, I, and I find... interests I find in Skyrim the more like the Yarl that has them the the the, the, the Yarls who have like more advisors around them, the more incompetent and inept they are. I mean, if you think about it, he has I think he has the one in in, in Markarth. He has what is it? He has two, two or three advisors around. Plus the Thalmor, which I, I I don't I don't even want to class that as an advisory, but I think they you know, they do have well they they're there to uphold. Um, the white gold can call it. Um, I think that's a nice touch, actually, having of all the cities, just having the Thalmor in Markov, because that's where the um, the original uprising started. I, I think that's, you know, again, to give the game a little bit of credit, that's a, a nice little touch. But again, you don't have any sort mm -hmm. of indication that Ondolomar is actually talking to Ingman because there's never a bit of dialogue. Instead, you just have him roaming up and down the castle, berating the docks. Uh, interesting touch, but um, it would be interesting if he had more significance in terms of the wider story of Markov, because that's another faction, another angle to play, but it's not really developed. No, no. I, I, I do but also remember, well, maybe one final point on the uh, Silver Bloods. When you first enter the uh, keep at um, um, Markov to the uh, the Isles, um uh, the, the old palace let's say um you have a silver blood and i can't i think it is it thorin i know this sounds i mean <laughs> I, st I think it's i think it's thorin or that's how you pronounce his name um who is sort of leaning against this wall and he's sort of shout he's, he's shouting at um um because he's obviously a sympathizer with uh, talos worship and everything else when you when you dialogue but he's um it's a i think it's about getting an audience with um yeah the um R. the R to talk on those matters and he's not allowed to even though he's part of the silver blood which i find quite interesting because it's like um, a lot of, a lot of things i mean if you put them all together 
again, it sort of it, it speaks to me of stuff that they had ideas for, but it wasn't developed because the first thing you do upon entering the citadel is he's having an argument with a priest of RK, which is again a lead into the Namira quest line. But that's my favorite all there. Um, and he's talking about, you know, you take away Talos, now you're going to deprive us from seeing our honored dead. Yeah. And you have that figure, and you have a Thalmor Justicia just roaming around in the castle. This figure is also the head of the Silverblood family, and yet he's just reduced to sitting next to a wall virtually the entire time, unless you take the city for the Stormcloaks and he becomes the Yar. So again, you have all of this potential for all of these... Uh, you know different conflicts but together there just isn't really anything there mm -hmm. in the game to extrapolate from also why the head of the silver blood family again is characterized as honorable in the sense that he wants the restoration of talos worship but again his family which has been controlled by his brother is just completely unscrupulous so again a, lo a lot of stuff which again if they have more time to develop perhaps could have been developed into fascinating plot lines yeah. but they're just a little stale as they exist currently in the game. I mean, I, I always thought maybe you know, he, maybe the older brother, the person you know, the the what the, the that's um maybe maybe it was the idea is oh a younger brother is too idealistic and everything. We'll just we'll, we'll just relegate him to the to the keep and he can pretend to be important up there. <laughs> so, um, I, I but I think overall when you look at Markarth, it's you know, uh, you know, the jury, um, you know, the Yarl is you know. The the uh, the the Arl is the uh, you know, overall leader of of of, uh, of the Reach, but sort of de facto, it's pretty obvious that it's um, the Silverbloods. Um, I think that's that's you know quite a nice segue to talk about probably one of the few holes where the Arl is actually in power, yes. which is White Run. Um, White Run has one of the few Yarls who actually seems to take an interest and actually seem to control events, which is Yarl Valgriff. Um, you know, he's often seen talking to his advisors, and he's one of the few Yarls who hasn't taken an explicit side in the conflict. And when asked, I think it's because he says he's on the side of White Run. So yes. I think in, in terms of a Yarl, in terms of someone who is, you know, supposedly pro your interests, I think again, I like Balgraf and I like the potential. I think I would like a bit more in terms of why he ends up supporting the Empire because you know he says it's about mutual advantage. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there isn't enough. I think I, I would like again to just push on that angle that he has some sort of moral objection to the way that he he doesn't essentially have any problem with wanting to take you know have a free Skyrim or whatever and fight the elves and not sign up to the. Uh, the uh, white gold on Cordat. Rather, he's suspicious personally of Ulfric, and he doesn't want Ulfric to take over. And then, for example, mm -hmm. let's just say he begins assassinating all the Jarls who have any sort of independent mindedness whatsoever, and establishes some sort of, you know, uh, centralized autocratic monarchical state in Skyrim, which again is a an interesting angle you can take and there are sort of, again, to the game's credit, there are allusions to that as to... Uh, yeah. Um, Ulfric being, you know, conniving and Ulfric having resorted to very devious methods, such as, so for example, uh, killing um, High King Torig by use, again, by use of the thumb. And there's a very revealing line, again, relaying this back to um, Sibyl Stentor in, uh, in uh, Solitude, when she basically says that uh, if Ulfric had gone up and petitioned the king to make Skyrim independent, he would have agreed. Yeah. So that, that's, again, mm -hmm. that's an interesting angle that it's not enough for Ulfric to have an independent Skyrim. It has to be an independent Skyrim led by him. Um, him wearing the crown. I mean, even, you know, accepting this role of, you know, him as the supreme warlord, effectively, you know, having the king there as a titular king and him being the general isn't enough. He has to be the king as well. I think that's an interesting angle. And I think having, you know, Balgraf in particular, I really think that was, again, a possibility to really flesh that out in terms of their personal animosity towards Ulfric and their general skepticism towards his aims. Because I think in terms of deciding, you know, what side you are in the conflict, to, to my mind, that's again an interesting angle to take you're not opposed to the ideas which Ulfric is espousing you're opposed to him leading mm. the cause uh, white tron is a very interesting hold it's very unique in its um 
in in its history in Skyrim. Um, and I, I I will I will I know that you you haven't you you don't know much the the, the lore if you, um, of um, you know like the sort of the second era and such. But I, I'll just do a quick overview. One thing that you during the um, uh, I guess you see before the uh, the rise of Tiber Septum, um, Skyrim went between sort of like you had the western half and the eastern half. You had like sort of two kingdoms, and you know it's, there'd be some points where Skyrim would be united, and then it'd be back into four kingdoms. But White Run was always like this own separate, um, like this own separate kingdom in many ways, um, and it, it was described in in um, legends and such um as uh, and, and and i think also in the um pocket guides to the empire it's like this you know it would have like this this flourishing market because that was the, that was its sort of uniqueness it had like these market towns because of the and if you think about it the road connections how many roads sort of lead to um white run um I'm, i think there's about what like three or four well one in every direction um, yeah and, and so it has like a natural trading hub uh towards it um and so hence it, it's never really had to rely on um um i guess like uh, re rely on its neighbors in that regard um and um you know it's it's also i mean you look at the sort of topography and geographical location it's a, it's a very large hold um and it's a hold that has uh you know uh, it's it's within the tundra itself. Um, uh, well, it's confined within the tundra. Um, so the the neutrality of itself is like a, it does. It, I think Bethesda's way was it's like oh it has like historic um, historical um, roots in that level of neutrality. I, one thing I would agree with you on is you see I was always, I remember when I um first played it i was hoping that there would be like some you would find out like the the uh the house of balgruff and the house of stormcloak had like some long ancestral rivalry mm -hmm. or something like that because maybe that would explain why he didn't trust them and they didn't trust each other yeah so um, it, it would it would improve the, the development of the characters and yeah it gives, yeah. It, 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 and it gets another angle because at the moment what i find infuriating about most of the yarls is that they're very static um, and just having another angle to it. This is nothing to do with the overall conflict. This is a personal, you know, a dynastic um, yeah. rivalry as opposed to a ideological rivalry. I think that could have, again, added a, a, an element of nuance, an element of world building, which wasn't that difficult to do. All you needed was to record a couple more dialogue lines. Uh, yeah. But again, this, uh, this sort of, again, speaks to cut content because a lot of, um, as far as I'm aware, there was a huge um, uh, Mafala-based uh, story revolving around the court of Balgruf, and virtually all of that was cut um, yeah. to the point that you just have, you know, the ebony blade behind a door. You just have to pit pocket a key, and that's it. Uh, but there was going to be, again, more development to that. So mm. I think a lot of White Run, as I mentioned, with uh, the situation with the Justicia and uh, the Silver Bloods in the reach is it just seems a little unfinished to me you know, take a bit more time to develop this i also have to put this out there because nathan hood is in the chat uh i will not forgive the creators of skyrim for just ripping off um the edoras uh Giselle aesthetic for uh <laughs> for white run and dragon's reach i will not forgive that even using the sigil of the horse um it's infuriating especially mm. as there's no real cavalry either in uh, skyrim you have the potential yeah. to really expand i mean having white run hold is a perfect position to actually have a pitched battle not a siege Cav cavalry, and yeah. um using cavalry as well and you just don't do that and again the whole civil war angle as much as we're talking about it in terms of the actual uh, playability of it it does seem that so much more was planned and it was all cut at the last yeah uh, at the last amount because really all the civil war ult ultimately amounts to is a couple of um, introduction quests and then a lot of fort taking 
um, and that's really it. And then you only have you know, two sieges, one attacking the respective capital of the other, and one either defending or attacking Whiterun. Um, and, you know, if I were to be really uh, not giving the writers any credit, I would say one of the reasons why White Run is neutral is because there are nine holds and four are allied to Ulfric and four are allied yeah. to the Empire. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. again, White Run for me is a, a place with a lot of potential. But in terms of, again, its um, geography, I think um, people are saying it's you know, quite viable uh, geographically. I would push back against that because apart from in the east against Riften, where you have a very strong uh, natural frontier with um, High Hrothgar and all the mountains there, um, I mean, essentially it's just open, open to invasion from all other sides. So um, again, I'm not sure about White Run in terms of the viability of it being a kingdom. Even somewhere like Falkreath seems more defensible than uh, somewhere like Right Run. And I think you know maybe this is a time to talk about you know some of the smaller holes. So when we go to Falkreath, for example, um, mm -hmm. in terms of like the political development there, the only sort of tangible point which one can really latch on is the fact that there is a young, incompetent, corrupt Jarl who is even sort of get you know getting payments from local bandit gangs and the only reason he's there is because his uncle supported the Stormcloak rebellion so again this would again potentially lean into that idea that the empire is just a bunch of corrupt collaborationists and they're effectively nothing more than puppets of the thalmor but like i said you know it's an interesting angle but they don't lean in lean into it enough no. and uh that is you know the 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 essential politics in summary in Falkreath, there's not really much else going on there. I, I also thought there was a big waste of opportunity because if you look at, and, and this is something that uh, I think has been pointed out before, is you know, your character is the Dragonborn and your character walks around this world, um, the same sort of world and the same province that Talos was brought up in. And, and you don't have the opportunity to relive any of his experiences, really, don't you? I mean, no, but but also, like, you know, his, his of course, he was in service to the king of King Kulikane of uh, Falkreath, yeah. Um, and you, you go to Falkreath, and I, even though I, you know, Talus worship is banned, I was expecting originally that there would be some, some, even if it's like a fort or something that was just dedicated to, um, Kulikane, because the, the Kulikane in law is described as this very powerful, very wealthy. Um, um, well, yes, I mean, to put it in king. context, um, had he not been mysteriously assassinated, it is likely that he would have unified Tamriel rather than uh, Tiber Septim, who was just his general before. Um, again, he was Kulikane was mysteriously assassinated. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, you see. I, Am you're sounding you're sounding like uh, a bit subversive here. I, I'd not I will not have this on this channel. Talos, Ty, my my boy Tiber Septim, absolutely had nothing to do with. Um, I, I didn't say that. I said he was mysteriously assassinated. I I, it was very mysterious, but it's. Uh, I mean, that, that is correct. I'm being I'm being factual here. I'm not, I'm being, not okay. making any insinuations. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I I know there'll be some people in chat who like to uh, sort of say that was I I. I to be honest, um, my sort of head canon on that is that um, Talos, because Talos does actually, uh, Talos Septon does have a brother, which is like met, like one ref, one mention um, in at all in any of. I think it's the um, is it the Arcurium Heresy? Um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and there's one mention. I mean, my sort of head canon is basically the, the brother was the Machiavellian one, wasn't very good at martial skills, and so he just sort of um, you know, he, he sort of did the, the hit job. Um, I mean, um, it's possible, but I think there's something more interesting. Someone's someone's bringing up on the chat, which is the idea of a dragonborn literally sort of reviving the Septim Empire as a new dragonborn emperor. Yeah, <laughs> again, it's a it's a huge gaping gap in the storyline because 
you know, essentially my head cannon thinking, you know, what will the Dragonborn support? He wouldn't support either side. <laughs> you know, if he would support either side, he would only support them insofar as it would build up a personal power base or a source of loyalty for him eventually to become the emperor. <laughs> because again, you're Dragonborn, you have a direct claim on the throne, you, you can claim the allegiance yeah. of the Blades, you can revive the Empire after establishing, you know, near godlike heroic status after defeating Alduin and again going off and uh, defeating Mirak, etc. Um, but, you know, this doesn't happen. Instead, the sole sort of real reference you get to Talos is the fact that in Hold Horolden, which is where, you know, his uh, campaign for Imperial Conquest really began, you have a couple of lines of dialogue in a generic inn, and you mention, oh, this is the bed that Talos Septim lied in, which is just a generic bed. <laughs> so not not yeah. even, you know, a, an original skin or anything like that or um, anything to sort of mark this out. And I really think this... Uh, a point I'm sort of mentioning a lot is talking about Skyrim and the potential, but Skyrim has ultimately, you know, got so much lost potential and that, you know, making Falkreath into, again, possibly a center of recreating the Dragonborn's own um, path to reconsolidating the Empire. It's the mm -hmm. fact that it's not even referenced. I mean, it could have made, you know, a, quite an interesting, you know, when you have that, um, is it season unending, where you have all the Jarls and you have the Emperor, sorry not the emperor general tullius um talking about a peace deal wouldn't it yeah. be interesting if just one of the neutral parties say for example esburn or um what's his name the, the christopher Plummer in the christopher Plummer, uh, yeah, I knew, yeah yeah i knew he mean yes yeah. if he just referenced you know bear in mind that tiber septum of course just be, you know was was dragonborn just a little thing like that could that could hint at the player's future but no it goes it goes nowhere and i think it's just a, the fact that no one even thinks about it, no one contemplates it. Yeah, that was. It's very strange. It's a very strange because, of course, your character can claim just divine rights. I mean, the, the, I think the, the most divine of all rights, um, as well. Um, yeah, and, and it, but, but again, this could this could really you know play into an important role. You know, say for example, um, if take for example the character of Ulfric Stormcloak, if he for example realizes that he's not going to win the war maybe he would approach the Dragonborn and say, okay, I'll support your claim to be the Emperor of Tamriel if you support my claim to be the High King of Skyrim. Yeah. Or, or little things like that. Or, for example, Tullius believing that, you know, I'm secretly, a, a, a you know, an Imperial Patriot. I hate the Thalmor. I hate Titus Mead II. I hate what they've done to the Empire. The Empire is drooling and corrupt and useless and is, you know, fully in the pay of their, you know, ostensible enemy. So let's get a new Emperor who will actually fight for the rights of the Empire. All of these interesting, you know, plot lines revolving around the Dragonborn. Uh, and none of this is even referenced or mentioned. And to me, it's probably the weakest element of the storytelling of Skyrim because yeah. It's the idea again that you're dumbing down all of these characters who has supposedly have historical awareness and you have this, you know, seemingly obvious solution to so much of your problems in the form of the Dragonborn and none of them exploit it. When you're participating in the Civil War, you're just another grunt. You're, you're a grunt who, you know, rises to a position of, you know, respect, but that's it. You, know, you never even become the second um, the second figure in either faction. You know, you're still subordinate to, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gammar or uh, Gam Gammar or or, or um, uh, or Rick Ricker. Ricker, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it really just does seem that the Civil War is um, underwhelming, and there are so many things that the characters should be considering. I mean, it's the fact that you know you go to say, for example, you <laughs> in terms of you know what is it called ludo narrative dissonance in terms of um, the disconnect between what the character has done and the actual sort of presence of the storytelling. I think that it comes across twice. Um, one is if you go to the um, the companions having defeated Alduin, and no matter what you've done, the response is always, "I've never even heard of this outsider." And then you go, then you go to um, you go to Ulfric Stormcloak again, doing the same thing, and um, he asks, "Do I know you?" You know, these people should be petitioning <laughs> the Dragonborn. You know, support our side. Support. You know, again, it's just. Uh, I, I can yeah, understand I mean, the limitations of actually creating a linear game in which people can decide, but um, yeah. all of these things, I think there should just be, you know, some sort of reference. I mean, have you played Fallout New Vegas? 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Many times. Yeah. I mean, at least in Fallout New Vegas, you hold on those faction decisions until you reach a point of suitable notoriety. And after mm -hmm. you reach that point, which is, you know, killing Benny in the casino, all of a sudden, all of the factions want you on their side and they're making petitions for you to join them, not the other way around what we have in Skyrim, is that no matter how notorious or famous you are, you're always treated like a grunt when you appeal to join one of the factions. I mean, so um, I, always, I always thought with Skyrim, when you have that moment where you 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 first your character first discovers that they are uh, Dragonborn, um, and then you have the um, Greybeards that call the Dragonborn to to Hyrothgar. I always thought at that point that should be like where the the, the propaganda mill of the of the Empire of and of um, of uh uh Ulfric would go into you know just overdrive go, yeah overdrive yeah because you you think about it you know from the Stormcloaks perspective they're fighting to re to for for independence also to uh worship Talos as as, as like sort of like the main issue when they're selling and it here you have a second Talos you know yeah, a second, second Talos, Talos rising yeah. at yeah. the moment that Talos is being but again that mention you know it's again a bit like the Neverine prophecy the resurrection of Nerevar at a time where you know the tribunal is about to come crashing down and Dagoth Ur is about to you know take over the world with a blight. This is something that they did correctly in Morrowind but failed yeah. spectacularly uh, with Skyrim. And I just again, I, yeah. I just don't understand why. To me, this is all serious, glaring problems in terms of the you know the creativity, but also the world building. But even the way you go about, you know, becoming Dragonborn, um, mm -hmm. the way you're instantly recognized, you know, that should have been that should never have happened. You know, one guard could have possibly, you know, noted, you know, oh, you might be Dragonborn, and, and everyone else collectively says you're an idiot. That that's impossible. You know, there hasn't been a a, a new Dragonborn since I don't know Martin Septim or whatever, who's not just going to randomly appear on this random battlefield. Yeah. And then there has to be, again, a process of proving slowly but surely that you are the Dragonborn. And then finally, you know, being recognized by the Greybeards can be this ultimate achievement, as opposed to just clearing out one, you know, <laughs> one one ruin filled with dragos and not completing the quest. <laughs> um, it, it just seems to me, it just seems a bit anticlimactic. And it's at that moment, as you say, when you're finally recognized by the Greybeards, like with Fallout New Vegas, that there is a propaganda campaign to get you on side. You know, maybe if you're, you know, thinking about game mechanics and how to decide how to design this, maybe before you become Dragonborn, you can do low-level grunt work. You can clear out a few fortresses. Mm. You can do whatever. You can do a series of limited quests, but you yeah. can't complete anything fundamentally game-changing in terms of the Civil War until you've been recognized as Dragonborn, and yeah. then your place and the story fundamentally changes um but again the, the or what could be in terms of development for the game and but what we have fundamentally is uh lacking all of that nuance yeah i mean i, I think to my you know you mentioned new vegas um but also i think of like like i think if you played kotor uh the first cold kotor that is um nice yes. of the public yeah is that uh, the the key the sort of like I guess you could say this discovery of your character, like what your character is, um, you know, like in Kotal, spoilers for people if you don't listen now, I can turn off, but that your character is Revan, or in that in, in New Vegas your your character becomes this sort of badass um wastelander, the the courier as is known as. Um it happens towards really as you mentioned like you have to do all the grunt work so most of the game is sort of completed at that point you're you're sort of towards the tail end of the the game gaming experience and i think one of the problems with skyrim is that you became dragon Paul, dragonborn right away and it didn't mean anything and it didn't mean anything when you did become it um it it would have been i i think if like the if, even if the whole game you weren't dragonborn but you heard references to the dragonborn not in the imperial sense but in the sort of you know the sort of um prophet um sense you know, with alderman's return and then at the end of the game like like with marwin do you discover that you are this this sort of second coming this this prophet who is um you know who who is you know who is to, to destroy you know, whatever plight that um yes absolutely play. and it, in the meantime in the meantime i mean you know you have game aspects like the shout for example um you can just 
introduce the character as being a character who is inexplicably um, proficient with shouts. That's all you are until you'll finally recognize the Dragonborn. You know, the player can piece it together. But the moment the player um, makes, a, you know, uh, mm. utters his first shout, he is instantly christened as the Dragonborn. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that's that's the problem. Uh, I mean, get back to KOTOR uh, very quickly, but um, it, same thing, your character there, you, you become, it, it, you, there's, ref, there's, I mean, and I, I would say KOTOR is like the one that uh, is up there with New Vegas as one of the best sort of like uh, role playing, but also dialogue where it, the story doesn't, it doesn't come with the same problems that, Skyrim has when it comes to continuity aspect is that your character in Kotal is able to you know, uh, learn the force very quickly but it's also very powerful in the force and it's sort of it, it sort of builds up to the realization that your character is you know, Revan and all that um but uh, yeah it, it does it in that way you know it um it uh it drops you can drop hints in these stories you can drop hints that your character is something more than than what is revealed at the time um Exactly. You can, the, I mean, again, this is a fundamental interactive storytelling. You're building anticipation for the ultimate mm -hmm. payoff of the character. Whereas you know from a couple of hours in the game that you are the dragonborn and then you are told you are the hero and then it plays out pretty much as you would expect it. There's no twist, there's no turn. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in Oblivion, you know, comparing Oblivion to Skyrim, what Oblivion does to avoid this problem is that you are not a special character in oblivion you are just a random prisoner who escapes and then helps the real hero of the story the dragonborn martin martin you are not the fundamental hero upon which the story rests and of course because you're not the hero martin is treated with sufficient awe that you would expect from the man who is supposed to um you know defeat the the forces of hell invading so in that sense the game actually correctly sort of judges the character but even as you know just the the hero of Kovac. When you go into a city, you have all of the uh, the Wes Johnson voiced characters just saying it's you, um, and uh, you know celebrating your antics, and have random characters coming up to you and thanking you. That doesn't happen in Skyrim, no. even though you're far more integral <laughs> to the story than just the hero of Kovac was in uh, yeah. in Oblivion. It um, it mystifies me. Uh, even to... in, even in Oblivion, after the siege of Bruma, they put like a little stat when you're when you yes, actually yes, they make they make a statue of you in Bruma. Yeah, and... yeah. Yeah, so cause I, I I remember I used to make sure I'd have all like my the, the best armor on the best looking armor on. So when that they made the statue, your character was look wearing the best armor because um, it depends on what you're wearing as well. Um, but yeah, they even make a statue to you, um, which is which is kind of neat. Um, should we get on to? We talked about White Run. Um, but I, I think, in terms of like the the other smaller holds, I mean, smaller holds, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, 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 I mean, one of the again, a, I would say, an improvement that Oblivion had over Skyrim is that the cities in in Oblivion all seem unique and they're all larger than the ones in Skyrim. I don't know why. I mean, they they improved uh, over Oblivion in one sense in the fact that the holds have a lot more, you know. Um, there's a lot more development in terms of where the where the economy is, where they get their food, in terms of farmland yeah. around various cities. You know, uh, White Run is a good example of that, and uh, the various other holes and smaller settlements. But the cities themselves are very underwhelming, which yeah. is a shame. And as is the case with all of the minor settlements, um, they are basically cut and paste, copied of one another. And you know, in many cases, you wonder, you know, Falkree, if it would make sense to have a settlement there. I don't know why there is a settlement in Morthal. Morthal doesn't seem like it can boast any economy whatsoever. It's just a dump. It's just a swamp. Um, it's just a no man's land between the between Dawnstar, White Run, and Solitude. The, there's no reason there should be any sort of living there whatsoever. <laughs> and of course, it's just riven with enemies and uh, vampires. Of course, so. Um, yeah. To me, you know, the fact that, you know, the the Yarl there is supposed to be psychic doesn't interest me at all because I wonder why there is even a settlement there and there's no interesting history in law to try and back that up. When you do go somewhere where there is supposedly some interesting law, like Winterhold, mm -hmm. you find out that Winterhold only consists of about three buildings and the rest of it is supposedly all fallen into the sea. 
uh, which is very underwhelming when you first approach there. The only thing of note mm. really there is the uh, the College of Winterhold, which unfortunately has a very underwhelming story <laughs> um, in terms of the, uh, the, the the only magical college you can experience in Skyrim. Then there is Dawnstar, which is perhaps the biggest of all of the you know minor holds, and you have the um, what's his name? Uh, I don't know, but but he's very sort of officiously pro Ulfric. And um, the first thing you hear upon entering Dawnstar is him basically saying to a bunch of um, you know Imperial sympathizers that if you try and contact Talias, I'll have you both executed. But beyond that, and you know his own thoughts on the war, you know involving, for example, the fact that you know the dragons have come back to wreak retribution on Skyrim for uh, the banning of Talos worship. That may sound stupid canonically, but to me it's interesting in the fact that they are mentioning some form of divine retribution for the sake of Ta for the forsaking of Talos. It's not just talking about the politics of this of these ostensibly mm. sort of inert gods and godlike figures. Um, I also think that the whole angle, you know, why is, you know, Alduin, you know, returning at this time, you know, if we forget the fact it's all about this, you know, time travel, you know, nonsense involving the Elder Scroll, um, that could be an interesting angle that this has come to sort of wreak retribution on, you know, the Empire and Skyrim and bring about the end of the world because of a moment of godlessness, which of course would appear in a medieval setting, but, you know, sadly that isn't the case and he's the only character to mention yeah. something like that. But apart yeah, from that, that all of the um the minor holds have very little in the way of interesting character quirks or anything i mean i think the yarl of white of winterhold which again winterhold is a historically significant city which should at least have its own aesthetic even if it's mostly destroyed alas it doesn't um you know his quest revolves just around you know attaining some sort of diadem to give him sense you know give him a sense of legitimacy but apart from that um they're all sort of basic when it comes to the actual politics behind all of these holds and of course they switch sides based on which support which uh, faction you support in the conflict yeah one of the biggest problems with with elder scrolls with, with all the elder scrolls games is that uh, and this is something that you have know, likes of todd howard they do talk about a lot and it's 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 it, he i mean he's he know he talked uh, one of his things he's when he's if you in all the interviews i've seen him in and he's asked, um, you know, what's your biggest regret? He always says about the cities, because um, he he wanted he wanted to actually, um, you know, he even wanted like villages, you know, more villages around the various holds and such, just to make it look lived in, um, at least. But I, 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 one thing I would, one thing that uh, a lot of the Elder Scrolls fan the community always like to say is, you you have the Elder Scrolls games and you have the law. Now in law. And I mentioned this in, in on my previous Elder Scrolls video on on my channel, is in in, in reality the problem all the holds and the provinces and the the continent and the world in itself it's all upscaled. So mm -hmm. in reality, um, like Daggerfall, for example, is one place we do know. In in now in game it would be like 40, 50 buildings at most, but in law it's uh, the population of the city is a hundred thousand. Oh no, I, I can understand that. Yeah. My, I, yeah. I'm basing this off um, the, only by comparison to Oblivion and Morrowind. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because and, technology, and, and, because and, the technology it, it is, is improving, yeah. and the cities are getting smaller, not bigger. Yeah, you know, that's the that's the problem. That's the problem. It, it, the, it, the technology improved, and the cities got um, smaller in in the sky, which I don't. I don't really understand how that happened because um, there is cut content. You actually, if you actually on the, on the PC mods that you you sort of go into the, the game files, you can actually see, um, like uh, especially with White Run, like uh, half, like there's a whole like new portion of a city um, yeah. out where the Kashyyyk uh, lot all sit around. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, but I mean, in law, if you it, you know, in law. Um, Solitude and um, um, Windhelm and Whiterun are, are meant to be like these um, very large cities. 
Yes. Um, but but again, my 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 problem isn't just the size. The size is a thing which frustrates me, especially when looking at something like Vivek and Morrowind or the Imperial City in Oblivion. Um, it's not just the size, but it's also the lack of individual character in the cities compared to somewhere like Oblivion. Yeah. Because really, Windhelm, Whiterun, and Solitude are the only cities with really distinctive aesthetics around from just anywhere you would encounter in terms of the generic countryside markov is just dwemer architecture riften just seems like an upscale version of the generic um hold capital and hold town you find everywhere so it's the lack of any sort of distinctive character i mean the only thing sort of riften has going for it which makes it somewhat distinct is bringing about the sewers which were you know a major <laughs> a major sort of irritation for oblivion players when you're wandering around the series of the imperial city mm. um but but even then um in terms of the lack of creativity regarding the aesthetics like i said white run is just edoras um <laughs> windhelm windhelm is you know somewhat interesting but it's just a stone block ultimately mm. and solitude i think is virtually all of the sort of designing talent and interest went into solitude um it's pretty obvious with you know the city over the arc and the the natural harbor underneath even though you know it's sort of like a generic sort of um upgraded version of the imperial architecture you see somewhere in the imperial city in oblivion it does yeah. seem to me that they spent far too much time on trying to make solitude memorable and unique to the detriment of virtually every other city in skyrim which again is i don't think there's any sort of excuse for this whatsoever but in terms of the the hold politics i mean we've talked about how riften is very much derivative of the situation in Markov and in the rift the only difference is that the silver blood family is you know swapped out with maven and the blackbriar which are a brewing dynasty and then you come to windhelm itself which is the seat of ulfric stormcloak other than what we've already discussed about ulfric stormcloak the main sort of political schism which is going on in the city because virtually there's nothing else going on beyond the city the rest of the hold is just a bunch of um natural hot springs and a couple of dragon attacks i think there's one settlement and kinds grove which is a um basically just an inn it's not even a settlement um and it's in that situation where you have the supposed segregation between the the gray quarter and the dark elves there the argonian dock workers working out um obviously in the docks and then you have the upscale um supposedly upscale um nordic housing on the western part of the city and then of course you have the um the massive stone palace of east Grimoire, the palace of the kings in the background mm. you have characters like brynjolf or oh, what's his name uh, not brynjolf uh uh the, the character replaces um uh Ulfric if you fight for the imperial oh um firebeard yes um i can't remember his first name now and it's something fi firebeard no uh Folk Firebeard is the advisor, and um, I think this is Free Winter. I, I, I can't remember. Well, exactly. no, Free Winter. That's it. Free, Free Winter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I can't it. remember his name, but you know, he talks about you know supporting the plight of the um, uh, the Dark Elves and that. And you have a couple of agitators wandering around the, the, the you know the Great Quarters, wandering about you know rights and improvements and that. And I think it's all very ham fisted, unfortunately. <laughs> I think it's, it's very obvi it's obvious what they're trying to get across. Yeah. It I mean, um, one thing I had a problem with some of the Imperial, um, I guess you could say people who would, you know, in the Imperial storyline, if you were to, to side with them and who would take over, um, <laughs> t take over a lot of the, like, um, uh, um, uh, Free Winter, he, he's a bit of, a, he's a bit of an NGO progressive type, isn't he? He comes across a bit like that. Um, well, I mean, the problem for, for me, I mean, he's not, I can understand, because I'm sorry, this isn't like a progressive archetype, the idea that the Jarl or the local ruler should be vested in the interest of all of his subjects. You know, even so, for example, we take a fraught situation like the French Wars of Religion, there was this debate as to whether one can be a Huguenot and one can be a Frenchman. And there was this dividing line as to whether the monarch would actually support the rights of the heretical subjects the French monarchy or dispose of them and that line was never clearly drawn so this idea that you know Ulfric has some sort of obligation to the non-Nords in his uh, hold is an interesting concept but to me it doesn't really make any sense because 
I would have thought by now that the Dark Elves would have been a firm established presence if we were to assume that Red Mountain erupted 200 years ago. So I do wonder, is this just a thing in Windhelm or is this a new thing which has been brought in by Orphric Stormcloak? It doesn't really make it clear because a lot of these characters have historical amnesia in the sense that none of the Jarls seem to have dynasties that they represent, which again mm -hmm. we mentioned with uh, with uh, what, what's his name, Balgruff versus uh, Ulfric could have been an interesting angle to bring in. Yeah. So I, I don't really know what to make of it. And the fact that they have housing, even though it's derelict to me, um, and the fact that you have the, I, I would say, the cartoonish quintessential Nord supremacist just going around saying, go back to Morrowind, it just seems cartoonish to me. It's not interesting. No. Um, the only sort of thing I would give Skyrim you know, props for is the fact that they do try and demonstrate some form of racial friction. Whereas in Oblivion, um, there is virtually no racial friction whatsoever throughout the no. entire story, apart oh. from things you, which aren't readily apparent. So, for example, if you go to Chaden Hall, some characters will mention, for example, the fact that, you know, the the Count there is a dark elf, or you go to Leowen and you mention the fact that there is some friction between the Khajiits, the Argonians, and the Imperials there. But apart from that, mm. unless you actually go looking for it, it's very yeah. difficult to find. No, I think the Khajiit one uh, down in Leowen is quite an interesting one. Um, I remember that one from, from uh, Oblivion. Uh, one thing I was going to say is that it, it, interesting about the, the Grey Quarter is if you do visit there and you go into the, the I think it's like a dark, it's like a clubhouse. Yeah. Um, there are, uh, there is, there are, um, uh, there is a flag in there, which um, I think it's either upstairs in, in the house or, or it's, it's represented downstairs, but I believe it's a, um, uh, a flag of a house, um, one of the um, Morrowind houses. And um, that came over. And so that's quite interesting because again, it's another missed opportunity. D does the the El the dark elves who arrive there do they belong to one um, great house or um, you know are they a collection of several great ha houses or if and if they are representative of one great house do they are they still doing the uh, bidding of the great house in in um, in Skyrim or in Windhelm? Um, yeah, more than that, are they are they worshiping the old tribunal temple or are they worshiping the reclamations? I mean, in terms yeah. of like fleshing out the Dark Elves, you get that later when you have Sol's time, and then you uh, talk to the, uh, you have the Telvani there, and you have House Redoran there, and you have a little bit of the house politics. But uh, I mean, I'm not going to blame Skyrim for this. I'm also going to blame Oblivion for this. Post Morrowind, the Dhamma have been pretty samey in terms of the house affiliation, their religious affiliation. All of it is sort of gone. And it's not readily apparent. But again, that's an interesting angle you can bring in. These Mafala worshipping Dark Elves bringing into this devoutly sort of Talos worshipping <laughs> Nord City. Yeah. Uh, of course, Mafala is essentially the uh, the patron um, Daedra of the Morag Tong. And of course, you know, the offspring of the, uh, the later offspring and the Dark Brotherhood. So there's, again, potential implications and ways of integrating uh, the various factions into the story because, of course, the Dark Brotherhood story starts off in Windhelm, but of course, is completely disconnected from everything going around. Nathan Hood is saying in the chat that um, Ancarno trying to take the eye for the Thalmor is a way of the guild impacting the politics of Skyrim. But I have to uh, to go against Nathan here and saying there is no indication at all whatsoever in the plot of the in the plot of Skyrim that Ancarno has that intention. The only sort of inference one can make is because he's a Thalmor. That must be his own, that must be his um ambition, but it's never sort of said. Um if anything, he could just be wanting to gain power for himself. And being a Thalmor is just a way of trying to set the player against him from the very beginning. Um <laughs> I'm sorry. And Carlo and the uh the uh the, the College of Winterhold quest line, I think, is I don't know. Again, it's if it is it's finished, it's <laughs> the Sigic Order though. 
Um, and they're sort of, I mean, because they just sort of like pop in and pop out in that quest as well, just like dropping a few hints and congratulating you at the end. But it's worse than uh, that. They're telling you that you will succeed. <laughs> they're basically yeah, like right. forecasting yeah. that you will win anyway. Well, thank you. That's all of the all of the suspense <laughs> and intrigue is gone. I mean, it'd be more interesting if the Sigic Order were the baddies and Ankarno were a good guy, <laughs> because oh. then you would actually be flipping the the archetypes which are so obvious and ever present in skyrim all the all the thalmor have to be bastards um yeah. no maybe in this instance ankarno is actually trying to wrestle away or trying to regulate this form of magic and maybe he is just incidentally again a genuine advisor from the thalmor maybe he's there only because there is a i don't know there is a special uh, magic college we are talking about the high elves after all maybe yeah. this is nothing political maybe he's just wearing thalmor robes because he is a representative of the eld mary dominion but maybe he's just an academic being sent over there again maybe as a representative of a college out there but all of that nuance is lost no he's just evil because he's a thalmor <laughs> and he wants power <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and the other interesting thing is, of course, in that quest, when you go to the Dwemer Ruin, to, when you want to discover the location of the um, the Eye of Magnus, um, you also you sort of work with this. Um, um, you find or well, you find the remains um, of I, I can't remember what, were they like Imperial battle mages or in, uh, Imperial. Um, uh, I think like the Imperial College or something, something oh, like that. Synod. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the synod. That's right. And um, when, <laughs> when, when you uh, because you, when you introduce yourself to the sole survivor at the at the end of the quest, the um, oh, you you can if you say like if you say you're from the college and everything, and then you and then you know you you uh, you crack the puzzle and you have uh, you know the, the image of uh, the problems of Skyrim, and then it's like you know, uh, the labyrinth is where the Eye of Magnus is, and then you have like the oh sorry the the um the um, the Eye of Magnus in um, um, Winterhold. Uh, Winter, Winterhold, thank you, and the the staff in the labyrinth, and he just he get, like automatically he just flips out, um, which I find quite funny. But um, he goes, oh, "What what are you guys doing that doing there and everything?" Um, and so that would have been quite interesting. That like like a, com a competition between like the various uh, colleges. Yes, and, and I, so I mean that, that would be. I mean. As we know, post um, post Oblivion, there is that stupid plot line in Oblivion revolving around defeating the Necromancers. Then it's all for naught anyway, because the guild splits off, and some of them support Necromancy anyway. So the, the Major's Guild, as we know it, is basically dissolved and replaced with the Synod. So this idea, again, of all of these magical guilds, whether it be the College of Whisperers, whether it be the Synod, or whether it be the Sigic Monks, you know, finding the eye of magnus and competing over it and then it is of all the people it is ancano the thalmor who is actually the one who's saying that this is too far <laughs> we shouldn't be playing with this thing we should be putting this away i mean that that interests me the idea of the sigic um the sigic order as actually you know coming out of hiding only in a response to trying to obtain this you know magic artifact and you know but, but again, you know, we're always betrayed the fact that the, the Thalmor are enemies and the Sigic Order apparently being repressed by the Thalmor. But again, this is maybe a reason why they're being repressed by the Thalmor is because they're involved in excessively dangerous magic. Just little things to try and make it's... the world building a bit more nuanced. All of, you know, I just thought of that off the top of my head in terms of a whole new plot line <laughs> revolving around the, uh, the, the Skyrim Mages Guild. But of course, all of that is missing i mean but also a plot involving perhaps the uh, the archmage himself i mean the only reason i wouldn't have the archmage being a villain is because if that were the case then he would basically be filling the archetype of the thieves guild and also the dark brotherhood as well but maybe just giving him a bit more depth i mean they try to and you have the uh, the final storyline and you have him you know locking his friends in a perpetual struggle against the dragon priest but again, there's no indication or that has no ultimate impact on the story. You're basically seeing something after the character who was irrelevant has ceased to ceased to be relevant on the stage. <laughs> it's interesting, nevertheless. It's something they um, perfected when they got to Fallout 4 and you had uh, that whole um, life story of Kellogg walking through his brain after he was dead and you couldn't interact with him and you were forced to kill him. <laughs> anyway... Yeah. Um, 
Um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, we're on to the uh, another important point, which is it's sort of, um, I think we've already mentioned it, but I mean, overall, um, I, I, so I know a lot of people, especially on the Imperial side, will will say, oh, the Stormcloak, Stormcloak Rebellion is, is basically just one massive um, diversionary, uh, you know, 4D chess move, move by the, the old Mary Dominion to just, you know, um, or like a you know, Palpatine-esque, like create a, fe- uh, a, a fake civil war to, you know, achieve uh, division and gain more power. And probably there is elements in that, but... I, 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 when they say in the in the dossier, when it says that you know he's an asset, um, it is quite clear that it's during his imprisonment during the Great War. Um, it doesn't expand whether he's like an, an asset during the rebellion, uh, during the Stormcloak Rebellion itself. Um, though, I, I think. When they refer to uh, Ulfric as an asset, I think it's like indirect, as in, you know, whether he knows it or not, he's doing he's he's doing them a favor. Yeah, well, like, it says here, it says here, doesn't it, under status asset, uncooperative. Yeah. So he's a indirect asset to the Thalmor. Yeah. Um, and this is why the Thalmor want him alive, so that they can weaken the Empire, which is why they had the White Gold Concordat there in the first place to create characters like Ulfric Stormcloak in the first place. Um, so you're you're right in the sense that yes, this is conforming exactly with what the elves want. Um, I, I'm just trying to avoid getting back into my argument of saying the Imperials should understand this as well. It shouldn't <laughs> be news to them. And they should have never you know been forced into the situation to begin with. But no, he's as far as I'm concerned, he's clearly not a Thalmor puppet. And if he wins the Civil War decisively then again, potentially, uh, you know, everyone wins. I mean, if Skyrim is rebellious and if the empire is overstretched, then them staying in Skyrim could potentially be a liability. Whereas a strong unified Skyrim without the Imperials having to send over troops or garrison stations or put down rebellions could actually be a benefit for mankind as a whole in having allied kingdoms, which are autonomous sovereign kingdoms against the Thalmor, as opposed to one empire, which is desperately unpopular and is facilitating its own destruction through the White Gold Concordat. So if anything, I think um, it was obvious, I mean, based on what the empire is doing that, you know, Ulfric winning the conflict quickly and decisively and um, consolidating an army against the elves and possibly entering into a future alliance with the Imperials um, would be the best option because the other option is just continuing to allow the Thalmor to dissolve and disintegrate any sort of lasting point of allegiance that the subjects of the empire have to the emperor, which is why the only sort of headcanon I have is that Mead is either being controlled by the elves or he's trying desperately to destroy any sort of sect in loyalism. <laughs> but um, so, but that that's my sort of understanding of it. And that sense, yes, of course, he's a d- indirect asset to the Thalmor because that's why the white gold concordat exists, as I've already said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing that I thought, I mean, I, I, again, this is sort of my head canon as well. I thought it'd be again a storyline, which I would, I mean, the, the, this one I would, I, I would think it'd be quite a, a, a funny one as well. Is like a like a sort of Elder Scrolls version of Iran Contra sort of deal. <laughs> so basically um a guild that operates within the Ultimary Dominion, which is controlled by the Thalmor, sends over um weapons and armor to um to the Stormcloaks, yeah. but repackages them through Morrowind so it doesn't have like uh Thalmor um I guess you could say like uh it could be traced back to to the old Mary Dominion. Yeah. Sort of like what you see in like Syria today, which has like the rebels picking up um, Israeli made. Well, well, there is an interesting angle, isn't there? I mean, do you remember? Have you played? Um, is it the Dragonborn DLC expansion? Yes. Yeah. Well, there is a quest in there where the Thalmor are wanting weapons made of Stolrim, which is a ice-based um, sort of pseudo metal, which is stronger than virtually everything else except Daedric stuff. And wouldn't it be an interesting plot twist 
if they were fetching Stolrim not to improve their own soldiers, but to send it to Ulfric Stormcloak. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I do remember that quest actually. Now, yeah, that would now that would be um because that because that would um I mean that that would be a, a very interesting um move, you know, because because it would also sort of show that they're actually you know, really because you, you hear um I think it's from Je uh, uh, Legate Ricker and also General Tullius is they they both acknowledge that the uh the Thalmor want the war to go on as long as possible um in some capacity um i think there was there's several characters that also sort of say that as well because they know that uh, the war's going on and also the the big the biggest the big uh benefits benefits of the war is also the um another group that lives under the thalmor uh that's uh under under the old Mary dominion is the uh khajiit because they if you look at the khajiit merchants who are there um in most of the conversations they just say that the the that they're there in Skyrim because war is good for business. You know? Yes, in, in fairness, though, I mean, this is, again, one of the seriously underdeveloped aspects of um, of Skyrim. Apart from the Khajiit cook and the Khajiit assassin they send after that wood elf, there is no indication at all that any of the Khajiits in Skyrim have any links whatsoever with the Thalmor. And yeah, yeah, I yeah, and I mean the thing that was I with your mode dominion, I I do wonder that because if you're if you're saying that the, it's like a sort of mid-century German sort of S-style state that all like uh, approved trade missions, they would have to have some loyalty to the party. Uh, but yes, yeah, it's never, there, there has to be some indication, some dialogue. I mean, just yeah. have some cryptic dialogue of just saying you know um i worked for for so and so agency or you know the, you know for example oh this makes a change from you know from escorting um you know you know battle majors from alanor or just some sort of hint yeah that some, they some were hint. formally um in the service you know, direct service of the thalmor but there's no indication towards that whatsoever and when you go mm -hmm. through the thieves guild you just understand that they're essentially nothing more than the branch of the thieves guild in the sense they just move merchants around and you know fence items for you so again that's an interesting angle but it's just not developed and all of this has to be sort it's of extrapolated as opposed to demonstrated which is unfortunate and again that could have you know been an interesting quest you know maybe you're one of the yarls and you know you have who is it that that, that woman in white run who's always saying you know they're they're picked on and um maybe she you know starts a quest where you have to try and exonerate them and let them into the city and then the twist of that quest will be actually no they're thermal operatives <laughs> just just little just little things like that you know um ways of bringing a little bit of intrigue in but no yeah. um instead they're just um they're just you know uh dubious merchants who are disliked and therefore kept out of the city <laughs> and that's the extent of their writing <laughs> um I, I don't know if that's like um you know uh, the, the 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 writer for, for the skyrim is like a uh, 4chan user confirmed um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean yeah uh I would say more on that, uh, but yeah, there, there, yeah, um, I, I, I do find it. In, I, I do find the um, that sort of trade that war, because the thing there is also. I mean, um, you have the silver hands mercenaries, but it, it would make more sense that you actually had like mercenaries joining up on the imperial side and mercenaries joining up on the um stormcloak side that they were just like you had all these people all, all i mean you could you could even have like you know, argonians and such joining the stormcloaks and but that could um, be an but that could be an interesting plot point couldn't it yeah rather than having because nathan is again saying in this chat rather than having the most stupid dumbed down versions of i don't know white supremacy or racism as exposed by the stormcloaks rather than having uh uh, Brunwolf free winter wandering around saying that oh you know Ulfric doesn't care about the uh, care about the um uh, the dark elves maybe instead have Brunwolf free winter betray a former stormcloak officer and he can lament the fact that he went 
to Ulfric Stormcloak, saying, wouldn't it make more sense to conscript Argonians and Dark Elves into the army to give us that edge over the Imperials? And then, for example, Ulfric turns to him and says, no, because that would weaken morale. And that would sow divisions within the army. Maybe something more nuanced yeah. and interesting like that. No, instead, it's just... Offer it's a racist because he's a racist. There's no sort of logic to it. I mean, it's not even you know, developed at all. It's just, I think it's just there again to give the, the the player who's wandering around Windhelm an incredibly, you know, it's basically like one point in favor, one point against. You come to Windhelm and mm -hmm. the Nords are racist, one point against joining the Stormcloaks. You go to the Thalmor Embassy. And many of the um, imperial nobles are collaborating with the Thalmor. One point against the Imperials. It just seems incredibly <laughs> so overly simplistic to try and demonstrate some sort of depth in the factions. But just having that little point there, that there is some ongoing debate in the storm on the Stormcloak side about broadening the conscription to non-Nords and what the implications would be on both sides. That would be yeah. interesting, but it's never addressed. No. And also another big opportunity that I just remembered was um, Legate Ricker when you first, uh, when you go after the, um, uh, is that crown, that mission to get that crown, which is like a yeah. long, uh, you know. Yes, yeah, a, yeah, I know yeah. the, the, the crown, I can't recall the, the name, but yeah. Yeah, it's the crown that the, the High King of um, Skyrim would sort of wear as a legitimate. The jagged crown. Jagged, yes, right. Um, and she sort of makes a sort of passing comment saying, remember, these, uh, a lot of these Stormcloaks used to be, you know, they are veterans of the, of the Legion themselves. Mm. Uh, and I, again, that, you see, again, that would have been, you know, you could have had, um, in, in places like Windhelm, the Legion that would have been stationed there, you know, you could have had like an thing where uh, like, a lot of them would defect and rebel, and then you would have like maybe some that were, wouldn't and you, you and and also in like in the armor and the clothing that it, it, yes there has to it, be some variety doesn't there rather yeah. than them all looking like generic hold guards well exactly like you, you would have maybe you even have like you know, the the standard imperial outfit but they dye it blue or they or they have like different colorings to make them look like rebels or what have you yeah so well, they just yeah, or they just like paint a white bear on the front or whatever to indicate yeah, you know stormcloak yeah. elite just little things like that to give a tiny bit yeah. of diversity or even just have a little bit of a dialogue where you actually meet a stormcloak soldier who isn't just a generic npc and says mm -hmm. you know i used to be part of the imperial army you know say for example coming you know fighting for the fighting you know for you know years in the great war and then coming home and finding that my own side of forsaken our religion broke me i had no choice you know, interesting little things like that yes. but no <laughs> i think i think through this discussion we've probably just created like the, the best old scrolls game <laughs> um <laughs> like the best of like civil war <laughs> um but, but again these are these aren't sort of great original ideas. These are just basic ideas that you and I are having by brainstorming yeah. the game that we really had. I mean, if one were to go away and really think about this and try and redesign it, I'm sure it could be much, much better. But these are just tiny little things that don't require any great wee work. All they require is just a couple of extra lines of dialogue. That's it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, when I use the example of, like, uh, you know, these actually make the Stormcloak... Um, um, you know, soldiers look more like defect, like uh, legionnaires, but um, just rebels. I was thinking, you know, maybe even uh, as as like, like a real world comparison. Think about like the Roman Empire and the, the crisis of the third century, where you had like the you you had uh, Palmyra, and then you had the the Gallic um, yes uh, breakaway, and it's you. Know, not so much that they, um, you know, that that, that um, legions in the in those areas, um, especially in the Gallic one, they still operated in and looked um, yes. and operated in the way of of, of legionnaires. It didn't like they didn't sort of re return to druid um, society yeah. because because they could could at that point because the you know the Ro Romans um, pretty much wiped out druid society. So it wasn't the, for them their culture was still that sort of Gallic Roman um, 
society. So I was thinking like a real world, something like that, where, um, and I think you, and you're know, going to about the Roman Empire, the reason why is you know, the Roman Empire, of, unlike any other, you know, tribe or um, civilizational force like the Celts or what have you, obviously had that lasting impact um, up until, well, I mean, I would argue that you know, through the church and everything, the, their their legacy was pretty much secured um, indefinitely up until modern day. But um, oh, that same could be said in the Elder Scrolls universe, because you think about the Septim Empire, um, it's the first empire where the whole of Tamriel was united. Um, and we, we hear in the law and everything that um, under the, the, the Septim dynasty that you, you had you know, these uh, forts were built, uh, roads were built, you had um, movement of population, uh, especially into Morrowind, as we mentioned, and you, you had like this, um, th this sort of, um, you know, I would say sort of golden age for at least of some time. And so... It, it, it should really reflect, I mean, uh, reflect on um, how uh, races and peoples in the world behave. And it's, um, I mean, I always, I think one of the problems with the Stormcloaks is that um, they, their sort of hatred for the Empire can, it also doesn't really make much sense because the the foundation the foundational myth for the empire is based on Talos, who is the who is the who is the god they worship. Absolutely, I mean, I mean, to me, yeah, as someone's mentioning in the chat, all of this would be solved if the Dragonborn played a more integral role in the Civil War storyline, and the line essentially was rather than. Ulfric fighting for an independent Skyrim just because the Empire are bastards. No, yeah. instead, I'm fighting for a free Skyrim under me whilst supporting a new Emperor who would be the Dragonborn, yeah. who would then go on and again, potentially in future games, fight and unify all the Manish forces. And again, you can you could even sort of ask this, you can have the player race, you know, impact on this. You know, maybe so. For example, if the Dragonborn were an Ultima, um, maybe um, Ulfric would have to be very reluctantly persuaded to support him. You know, if you said, you know, I don't care about the Aldmeri Dominion, I'm just going to um, support the Empire and I will resurrect Talos, and I still believe in your cause, even though I'm an Ultima. You know, little again, little elements like yeah. that which you can bring in to complicate, you know, make the story more interesting, instead yeah. of just making it. You know, we're, we're blue generic um, Skyrim hold guards with the same voice actor versus the generic, you know, uh, leather armored mm. um, Imperial soldiers with the same voice actor. Mm. And again, mentioning your idea about the Gallic Empire versus the forces of Aurelian equivalent, I believe having troops who sounded, you know, similar, they weren't, you know, monolithic entities opposed to one another, wearing similar outfits would actually make the conflict more emotionally engaging because they are. In a civil war they are brothers fighting you know fighting each other they aren't yeah. just you know the blue faction versus the red faction no. which is how they um they ultimately sort of transpired in the war but yes i think in terms of resolving that issue about Ulfric's, you know you could say that disconnect between him hating the empire and him hating the thalmor when really he should be wanting to restore the empire not wanting to destroy the empire um, because again, what, what is the point of you know creating an independent Skyrim just so you can venerate the founder of the empire? It doesn't really make any sense if you put no, it. That no, way. no, that, that, that's the that, that's the. I mean, that's one of the big problems I've had with like the Stormcloaks and why I think again. I mean, I, I I will be honest. In my my when I do play the game, I usually side with the Imperials just because I I know they're not. None of it makes sense if you think they dig when you dig down. But um, I I. Um, it, my problem is if I, it would make sense if the Stormcloaks were saying, you know what, we don't want to have anything to do with the, um, you know, the Elven inspired eight divines, nine divines. We're going to return to tradition. We're going to go back to the Nordic pantheon of like the the gods of you know Kine and um, and uh, Shore and stuff like that. And you and it's all going to be down to like the animal. Um, sort of representation of exactly. the Exactly, but that's an interesting and angle you brought up because this would mean 
that the Stormcloaks and the Imperials aren't monoliths, that they are a they are respectively, they are groups of warring factions within themselves. Say, for example, take the Spanish Civil War. The Spanish Civil War, um, the nationalist faction, say, for example, was composed of groups who, again, seemingly had nothing in common with each other. You have the professional army under Franco. You have the Carlists, who were um, legitimist monarchists. You had the Falangi, who were Italian-style fascists. And you had the Theda, who were just basically the mainstream conservative party in Spain supporters. All of these factions together to create the national the national movement backing Franco. Whereas wouldn't it be interesting is if you had a little bit of inter, um, inter sort of factional friction regarding the Stormcloaks, where say for example, Ulrich Storm, Stormcloak was say for example, supporting a restoration of Talos in the empire and supporting the Dragonborn in this conflict. Whereas other more hard line um, uh, Nordic, uh, again, independence advocates basically said, no, this has gone on far enough. We want nothing to do with the empire. We don't want to fight the elves. We just want to be left alone. And in that case, we'll go more, more to an authentic, again, a, a campaign for authenticity, uh, like you have in many sort of African countries after the end of colonialism, you know, removing any sort of tangent names, anything that can link back to our association with this monolithic imperial culture. All of this would be fascinating and interesting. Um, but of course, you know, the thing which to my mind really undermines um you know Ulfric's because on the one hand Ulfric wants independence yet he also wants desperately to fight a war with the elves where well, Skyrim cannot fight a war with the elves on their own so what's the solution it'll be an imperial restoration not to destroy mm. the empire and then ally with it which seems asinine <laughs> so yeah. again but again what we're talking about we're talking about nuance and we're talking about factions which are diverse they're pluralistic yeah. and they have various people who are in there for various reasons like we said a possibility for why balgraf would side with the empire against the stormcloaks is because of a dynastic rivalry um with the house of windhelm all of these little things and it's just deep down it's all just all of the all of the factions are motivated by the same thing which is this imperial um, ideology versus the stormcloak ideology which tends to pertain around do we collaborate with the elves in order to prep for another war or do we fight them immediately do we ban Tal talos worship in the interim or do we openly worship him now that's it <laughs> and i find it rather infuriating because <laughs> there is so much more you can do with it yeah i was just, i was thinking that the there is a character in skyrim I, I, he's um he's situated that this um I, it's out in the middle of nowhere it's in this hut and you he's it's near um one of the point uh i think it's near a dragon um um uh, uh, one of the walls the shout walls um shouting walls um and it's um he he's like this old man and he has a i think it's his grandson who's like a, um an orphan from uh helgen um and he's he's quite like a <laughs> I, I i sort of view him as like a like a bit of a, a Vodian sort of character where he said oh yeah it's, it's it's all doomed it's all over i don't care about the civil war it, it, it literally it just, all good things about nords just ended like thousands of years ago we, i'm more interested about uh, what he, he basically sends you out to uh learn about uh the, the nordic pantheon as we mentioned so and that's the thing that was really frustrating is that again in the law um places like riften like uh windhelm like winterhold um and dawnstar um have a long tradition of actually being more when they when it comes to religious practices they, they'll have talos of course because he is one of them because he's a nord himself mm -hmm. um but you also have they will also refer to kine or to shore um or to um uh, i think even you know something like lorcan and such they they still revert back to their um their uh, uh nordic pantheon it's just western skyrim which are more um i guess you say more more aligned to um places like um high rock and and cyrodiil where you have a more established um uh you know eight or nine divine um and um uh, i mean that again it's just it's a very disappointing because obviously i think they did have the idea because they had characters like that in there who were like i don't care about 
you know, the eight divine. I don't care about um, any of that sort of stuff because for me to be a true Nord, you have to be following, you know, this Nordic pantheon. Um, or anything else is just elven hybrid nonsense. Well, I mean, the meta, which the sort of the game tries to get across is that, yes, these arguments do seem pointless. And yes, the conflict is actually pointless because we're all supposed to be defeating Alduin. And this is also pointless from the perspective of the Thalmor because the conflict is just helping them. So really, why bother? <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, 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 there is there is sort of a, a feeling of genuine narcissism. I mean, back to your point about religion. I mean, what ultimately changes when Ulfric wins the Civil War? There is a church. It's one of the only sort of churches in Skyrim which actually looks like a imperial cult church from um, from Oblivion, which is the Church of the Eight Divines in Solitude. The only thing that happens when the Stormcloaks win is that an empty an empty space, which had originally been the um, shrine dedicated to Talos, is rededicated to Talos, and that's it. <laughs> uh, there is nothing sort of more substantial. And, and again, I just feel that there is so much in the story which, you know, when talking about, you know, why side with either faction, I'm just disinterested and wouldn't join any faction. <laughs> Again, the only sort of reliable sort of thing in my head canon is that I'm the Dragonborn. I should be the Emperor. Why am I bothering to spend time? <laughs> yeah, with I, you? I determine which faction I am. <laughs> um, yeah, because canonically, yeah. it doesn't make sense unless you um, try and rationalize it the way that we've been trying to rationalize it. In which case, um, in both cases, you can say Me uh, Titus Mead the Second will die. And he doesn't die as a result of um, a random quest involved in a random um, uh, guild line, which barely has any connection at all on the main plot. I mean, this is how ridiculous the game is. You can assassinate the Emperor, and then you can join the Imperial faction and fight and win for them in the Civil War. And it changes absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah, you still swear allegiance to the Emperor, but you don't know who the, the yeah. heir is. Exactly, but it, it doesn't matter. I mean, you could potentially, you know, start off the quest where you're going to assassinate the emperor. You can go and join the join the um, the imperial army. You can swear the oath of allegiance, then assassinate him, and then continue on as if nothing had happened. <laughs> this is at the average Praetorian guard there, AM. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Actually, as on the topic of Praetorian Guards, we mentioned the Blades. Um, sh do you think, have you got anything, or your views on the, um, what was it, the... Penitus Oculatus. Penitus Oculatus, thank you, that's that's the one. Uh, I don't really have anything to say on the Penitus Oculatus, because, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the Blades. Um, the Blades, of course, are a mainstay, in the sense that they are the, they're essentially the plain clothes police and they are the imperial bodyguard unit they have you know links back to the you know the Re raymond cyrodiil and the akaviri and that yeah. is demonstrated in their their aesthetic and of course that's demonstrated in the game when you go to um uh what was it sky altar temple or whatever it is where you cloud, find out cloud, cloud ruler temple uh, no not that that's in that's in oblivion um the one in oh. skyrim the one where you go and you see alduin's wall um, anyway, it doesn't really matter. So there's an interesting history behind them, but I, I just always found them a rather basic faction that was um, unfocused and rather unfinished and also came across as rather stupid. Um, they aren't as uh, interesting as being part of like an interior ministry or being a spy faction should be. Nevertheless, they appear in Skyrim and Delphine is essentially the sole member, active member of the Blades. And she basically treats you like a lackey, despite the fact that, according to her own logic, her sole meaning in life is derived from serving you. She even demands that you kill Parthenax, a dragon who has been assisting you the entire time, just because at one point he'd assisted Alduin. So, I, I don't know, it's just... <laughs> I've never been a big fan of the Blades, and the Blades' representation in this, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if there were a mod, I would go out there and just kill the Blades, because they serve no function, useful function to me whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I mean... As for the... But, but again, in terms of law, back to your point, there is an interesting aspect in them, in the fact that they are loyal to the Dragonborn. 
they're not loyal to the Emperor of Tamriel, they're just loyal to the Dragonborn. Yeah. Ostensibly, again, loyal to Riemann Cyrodiil and to his heirs, and then to Sight Tiber Septim and his heirs as well. So there's all this interesting lore and history, but it, again, it doesn't really go anywhere because the Dragonborn's role in the story is so limited in terms of his actual significance to the wider world. And like I said, it's as if anyone could have done this and the, um, the Dragonborn is really rather relevant. So when it comes to the Penitus Oculatus, it does make sense that such an organization would exist, but not for the reasons that the game presents it. The Penitus Oculatus in the game is founded because the Blaze were wiped out by the Thalmor. Wouldn't it be far more interesting if the Penitus Oculatus was founded to wipe out the Blades? Kind of, again, you bring in the Palpatine comparison, if they were the clones wiping out the Jedi. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that wouldn't that make them more interesting that they were well, well, new well, new basically a new hit squad there to serve as the Mead dynasty in particular as opposed to the Blades who were seen as a liability? Well, when I first played the game because I wasn't really paying much attention to the the comic because I, I have a habit of like skipping conversations in that when I was younger. Um, I actually thought that was how it went down. I I thought that the the uh, the Blades were wiped out um i knew because of the thalmor but i thought like uh, they, they, it was they were wiped out um after the great war fully by the pentus Oculatus and and the new regime due to the white gold concordat mm. um but obviously that wasn't the case he, that would have been uh, i mean because then you could have actually had because the one thing i've noticed is that the uh pentus Oculatus were are very much clovian based so it could have been internal like a, an internal um, regional power dynamic where the Clovian estates um, are trying to um, effectively um, push out any remnants of the septims who, who of, of, of like uh, septim institutions like, you know, the, I know they predate the septims, but, um, you know, it, it, um, the idea that they fear the loyalty uh, the blades don't have that absolute loyalty to the, the to their fellow Colovian emperor and the Medes, um, and so that there is like a because I've, I've I talked about in my previous video the the relationship between the Nebanese and the Colovians and the fact that you know the that it throughout the or uh, even even in oblivion but throughout the time of the Elder Scrolls that it's, it's really been. Even though they're in the same province of Cyrodiil and they're sort of you know, somewhat similar, they actually are very different. Um, very different uh, groups of people um, in the law. Um, so, I mean, that's something because I, I, if you look at the Medes, everything it it seems to be very Clovian based in, in in like people who are in positions of power. Even even General Tullius, you know. It's, Part of that sort of imp Clovian sect, um, but again, that would that would be interesting though to see yeah. divisions among the Imperials. Again, not the Imperials as a monolithic block, but also see that there's an ethnic angle to it. In the actual Skyrim, we have again, in terms of my my oversimplified point, which is how factions are represented. In that, Stormcloaks are racist, and the Imperials are not racist, they're inclusive. That's that's basically, you know, one point for the Imperials, one point against the Stormcloaks and the game's mindset. When in reality, wouldn't it be more interesting that there was a Colovian hierarchy within the, within the ranks of the Empire and that talented officers were being shunted and pushed out because they weren't part of this new elite who had risen alongside yeah. Titus Mead and his successors, but again, all of that's gone and as a result of that the penitus oculatus which had they filled the rack the uh, position that we were advocating for instead they are just a bodyguard unit which fails to protect the emperor that's all they are there's yes. nothing there's nothing to them that they, they don't have any sort of political angle and they play no role whatsoever in the civil war storyline they could come to skyrim after you've won the civil war for the storm cloaks and protect the emperor they don't go away either, it's just unless you were part of that Dark Brotherhood angle. So they really are just pointless in terms of an Imperial faction. They're simply there to be the eyes and ears of the Emperor. And yeah. in that sense, of occupying a very limited function. Like I said, the, the actual sort of secret police in Skyrim are operatives of a foreign power, the Thalmor, 
which, as I have to keep mentioning over and over again, makes absolutely no sense and wouldn't be tolerated by any nation unless the elites who were part of that nation were in on it, which they're not, because you get that impression from Talius that he's well, trying to rid themselves of this faction. In in reality, a Colovian uh, warlord, because we, as I said, the, all the Colovians are basically warlords, or and they have incredible martial skills, and so they're even the band. I mean, the, the thing that the Medes were originally bandits, so that you would have if, if if you had that sort of level of weakness, as we said, they would just be overthrown by the next. You know, next but wouldn't war. that be fascinating, though? You mentioned, you know, Titus Mede, the bandit king. Wouldn't it be fascinating that because they came from bandits, they were seen as politically ruthless, you know, bloodily dealing down and putting down yeah. revolts, ki you know, killing their enemies, you know, again, to make the imperial faction seem ruthless, but also in a, in a way, but again, to less scrupulous characters, to more mercenary characters, the empire, for example, rather than it being a moral question, maybe it, maybe it could be a material question, you know, yeah. uh, players who are more materially focused, who are more inclined to play the mercenary, support the empire because they pay more for their hired killers. Whereas if you're more idealistic and you're willing to accept, you know, crappier gear and less money, you support the Stormcloaks. But again, um, that, that's an, another angle which is lost. You know, Nathan Hood is also saying that uh, even being the head of um, Clan Volkahar uh, doesn't make any difference. No, you, you get a couple of comments from your vampires. Um, not really. It doesn't really make any difference even within the castle, <laughs> let alone beyond it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, one thing I would say is there's a really good book. Um, uh, well, it's a bit difficult to get into, but it's, I think it's a good book. It's The Infernal City. I don't know if you've um, ever come across it. It's um, it's one of the few Elder Scrolls books out there. And it's it's by Gregory Keyes. And it's, it's, it's a really good book. And it actually explains the, the first mead. And his his rise to power and and uh, you were right when you said you know the, the ruthlessness he, yeah he was because at that point after the oblivion crisis um it wasn't just provinces that started breaking away it was just like regions within the provinces i mean like uh <laughs> bruma uh i think it was bruma and, and lerwin actually became like republics mm. for, for a brief period and then you and then the empire really just consisted of a few odd territories outside cyrodiil and then the imperial isle and you had like this emperor called um it's like something the gibberer you know something like that until um until titus mead sort of you know the, the clothing states got back into the full gear and he he's you know amassed this army and then he, he, he the first titus mead his whole reign was basically just reconquering um the imperial lands um and um you know so, so i mean yeah th that's the thing it um um, and and in, in in the book, it, he he was described as being a very cunning and ruthless um, individual, uh, but also you know he uh, his son who uh, that's an interesting story in itself. He sort of starts off as a bit of a uh, bit of a sort of a, a fool and a bit of an idiot, but he has um, um, his quality that's sort of redeemable is that he's noble, loyal, and um, and basically has a, a sense of duty and honor um and so that that's sort of like his re redeeming qualities um about him is he assassinated or is there some sort of <laughs> no no so that's atribus mead atribus mead um because he marries this breton woman who is um she's involved in this floating city this daedric um thing i i you know, I, I can't remember the full story but he um he he get, he goes there to rescue him. One of the funny things is, throughout his, when he's this this the heir to the empire and everything before all this, he's like he's meant to be like this great the greatest warrior in Tamriel, and he has like his own like blades the you know, the blades of this this um special um bodyguard unit which is separate from the blades, um, even though the blades work within him within this group. And then they have to be like the best fighters. But then he finds out that actually every single battle he fought, every single um, conflict he went to, it was all staged by his uh, father, the emperor, the first mm -hmm. Titus Mead. And so he's actually not like this great fighter. It's just a massive, you know, massive con job. But it was done to, um, I guess, help him when he when he has to succeed his father as you know being seen as a strong, capable warrior figure. Um, 
And but he overcomes that because you know he comes across this dark elf mercenary and he actually teaches him how to really fight because he mm -hmm. discovers that he discovers all this the, all the lies and everything. Um, and he and he 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 then you know, he he goes from a character who's basically just a, a false um, you know this false figure whose life is a lie, and he you know he learns you know uh, sort of. Oh, 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 very, I would say he goes through like the sort of various like chivalry sorts of uh, attributes you know, in each chapter, and at the end he becomes. Um, uh, we don't really know what happens, but it's sort of alluded that there's like this golden age under his rule, um, even though by that time, um, you know, um, by that time, the Old Mary Dominion is is. It, it's not really explained what's happening, but there's like this frontier conflict of such in uh, Valenwood at this point, where the Imperials are backing one side and the Alt Mary Dominion are backing uh, this other faction. And there's like this um, conflict within, uh, let's say, of over who gets influence. But um, I mean, it's a very interesting book. I do, I would say, give it a read. It, um, uh, it's um, it's been out for a while. It's uh, it's it's very rich with lore and that information of that time period as well, um, and um, it, it it does change your. I mean, it highlights how incompetent um, Titus Mead the Second is compared to his predecessors. It's like, <laughs> yes, like I said, I I I never read or probably won't be inclined to read a um a law book on the Elder Scrolls, but you know, just basing it off the decisions of. Uh, Titus Mead II. Um, I just think, again, there's a huge amount of mispotential. I, I'm aware of one snippet of law that canonically he isn't actually responsible for taking back the Imperial City that's given to another player to wield Goldbrand. So even then, um, mm. he just, again, it's all superficial. Even his achievement wasn't his. So yes but, but again this is this is all potential that's that's been wasted i mean the, the basis of the stream i'm not sure exactly what nathan um um had in mind here but uh, you know maybe it's not helpful that um I, i'm one of the only two left of the four but um i just look at skyrim and i see what could have been and i see what's left is um childishly superficial and it's a shame in a way and i on honestly wonder these people who actually seriously debate because I I'm, I'm sort of tangentially aware of this, albeit luckily I've never been involved in this sort of thing, Imperials or Stormcloaks, and I, I just wonder why people care so much. <laughs> because to me, it's just it's so superficial. And like I said, the uh, a, a lot of the problems can be improved by improving the quality of the game itself and mm -hmm. the role playing aspects, which aren't there. I mean, to contrast this with what we have in uh, Fallout New Vegas, say for example. Um, in Fallout New Vegas, you have four choices. You can either support, you can either be materialistic ostensibly, and you can support the ruling power behind the casinos in New Vegas. You can essentially support um, a newly created version of Caesar's Legion, uh, which endorses slavery, but also it's against drug use, is against what they call profligacy. Um, of any kind and it's basically believes it almost has a civilizing moral mission to again bring some sort of iteration of cleansing all the pre-war aspects that brought about uh, uh, you know mm. nuclear armageddon and if you talk to um uh caesar himself he goes through all of this in exquisite detail explains his backstory and the methodology by which he's built this uh, very postmodern state he's fully aware that it's simply based on uh, a couple of scraps he found and a couple of old books referring to imperial roman history and then of course you have the ncr which is a newly created recreated version of the pre-war american government which is characterized as being vast, powerful, ostensibly, has all the material and the manpower, and manpower, but is riven by factionalism. And there is enough there in terms of ideological mm -hmm. justification, internal sort of factional disputes and motivations for various characters to be joined to one side or the other. And I feel that because this game came after, you know, out after Fallout New Vegas, probably not enough to actually influence the storytelling. I think that is readily apparent in Fallout 4, but I feel that the quality of the factions in Skyrim are infinitely worse than the 
quality of the factions in Fallout New Vegas. And in terms of the actual sort of political implications, I think Fallout New Vegas has a lot to chew on compared to Skyrim. Uh, because um, like, like I said, I mean, if I want a historical comparison to what happens with Ulfric Stormcloak, well, I just need to again point to <laughs> any you know generic um, independence faction and then say, well, even most independence factions aren't this simplistic. And like we said, Al, um, from Ulfric's own point of view, it would make far more far more sense if he was advocating for a form of re imperial rejuvenation or restoration rather than independence, because the actual argument for independence isn't there. It's simply an argument against the current iteration of the Imperials ruling over Skyrim. There isn't actually a real argument for independence in the Stormcloak pantheon. It's simply the Empire has betrayed its cause. We will set the path straight, which why then advocate for independence? And again, the, the Dragonborn could potentially solve all this. And I yeah. wonder why, because if it's obvious to us, it should be obvious to the, the writing team that was on Bethesda, why they decided so, to opt for this. I mean, I've, you're probably aware of this AM, but there are people who do like studies, you know, like, like real st studies into, uh, academic studies into Elder Scrolls politics. Um, and one thing that's quite interesting is if you look at, uh, I saw a few charts to, while, while I was doing all this and uh, putting the thing together, and I was just quite curious looking into it. Um, I, I think what you have is an overabundance of putting, um, at, I did, cause what this game came out in 2011, um, there was a lot of politics of current world put in there. So, of course, you talk about, you know, sort of like, the racism um but also um there was i think what 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 the what the dynamic was um is that you yeah that they they wanted to create a a independence factionalism faction um but i think i i think that they did it in i in many ways i think you could argue that the mead the, the mead um uh dynasty at that point would be the independence faction because um it's quite clear that they are more favorable you know revealed you know, revealed preference and actions they've committed they're more favorable to whatever the um old mary dominion wants so in my mind you that you could argue okay well that is the independence faction that's the one that wants to you know go off with some other superpower and yeah and so ulfric becomes the uh restorer of the empire you know um yes but i mean just put this in perspective also because in the game you get the option of supporting two factions from a fundamentally nordic point of view all of these yeah. decisions are characterized as if the player were a nord the player yeah. can be of any race. I mean, it's you know the, one of the problems I think with Bethesda is that it is un, fundamentally unable to create a role playing experience whereby the experience changes fundamentally dependent on what race you are, other than a couple of statistics which are watered down with every new iteration of the game. So, for example, with Morrowind, it's very much expected that you play a dark elf. With yeah. Oblivion, it's very much expected that you play an Imperial, albeit it doesn't really have any impact on the story whatsoever, what race you are in that game. In this story, it's very much, you know, the implication is that you play a Nord. What if I wanted to play a Elf who was also supporting the Almeri Dominion? I have no option in this game whatsoever. So yeah. again, like we see with Fallout New Vegas, you have an option of basically supporting any faction or supporting no factions and going the third way that you and I discussed, whereby you take power personally. Um, I just think, again, perhaps more options, more sort of um, differentiation in the factions would make this more interesting. You know, I have no problem in there being a xenophobic um you know in, you know anti-imperial faction that just wants you know nords to rule and wants everyone else to leave that could be interesting just not in the way that it was portrayed in skyrim one mm -hmm. faction which is just you know again people like erica collaborationists who are just supporting 
the um, the Almeri Dominion because they are ultimately all corrupt and you want to play the uh, corrupt mercenary. So you go ahead and support that faction. Or there is the Imperial faction that wants to get rid of these uh, collaborationists with the Thalmor. So oh. you try and lead a, you know, a pure Imperial restoration. But all of these things are just dumbed down to a simple choice of supporting red and supporting blue. And I just I find it internally frustrating whenever sort of contemplating this game or my memories I have of it. Yeah. I mean, one thing I also, I mean, thinking back to Fallout New Vegas, one thing I always think back to is the... Um, when you're in the world, it's like the factions there, um, they don't revolve around you. They just exist in that world and you walk into their space or into their whatever they're doing at that time. And it's 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 kind of like um, uh, the, the world just carries on with, with or without you that present. And of course, one of the problems I have, and maybe this is just the way the games are designed because you, you're the dragonborn, you're the center of, you, you, you are the the main protagonist and all that, but it's it's kind of like wherever you go in Skyrim, where everything, you, the, the whole story, it, it, it every, everything that happens in the world revolves around you. And um, you know, uh, another game that I ha I I played recently, which I've really enjoyed, you know, recently because I've, I've had it for some time, but I haven't actually you know, had a chance to really dig into it. It's been Kingdom Come Deliverance. Um, that I I think is a very good very good medieval game. And it's the same sort of thing. Is it's it's um, while the while it may not be more accessible, because uh, I, I spoke to Nathan Hood about this, and you know, he said, "Well, it's a good game, but the trouble is it's not you know, the mechanics of it. It's not very accessible for the for, for players." Um, and then you have to, which is yeah, that's fair enough. So from a game game perspective, they wouldn't you know, they wouldn't really um, go down that route. But you could have like just create a world create a living breathing world where people where some people do have certain jobs in that and make it so that um you know, your whole the whole character experience doesn't just exist around um you know, everyone do you know, everyone doing everything that um um you every everyone like um just trying to think of the words, making uh, making the story ever, uh, all the time around you, if that makes sense. That um, the the world just exists whether you're present or not. Um, and I, for me, that I think that's one of the problems. I, I think with Elder Scrolls as a whole is that it's um, the world doesn't it doesn't feel that organic. Um, with the player i mean and we've talked about going back to all we what we said about um you know how how people interact how people talk what they say um sort of um things like uh you know things like a a house for example a dynastic house rivalry yeah, so we talked about that like belgroff and and um stormcloak some sort of historical rivalry there um something like that you know, so you walk in up, upon you know uh, uh, friction between two two yarls, or or yarl and like a count. You know, they, they could have. I, I, this is the other thing. Is a uh, uh, there was um um they could someone as uh, someone on a forum suggest you know was, was on the, what we've been talking about said wouldn't it have been great if you had yarls and then below them you had like um um the house calls were like counts. So they all had like the all the house cars instead of like hanging around um in the you know in the palace, they all had like their sev like their little holds around the map. Well, I mean they try to do this with the Thanes and they just failed miserably and becoming yes. a Thane in Skyrim is almost a meme. Yeah, it's meaningless because it's you, know, you just hang around the mead hall drink, you know, and they all just stand around sort of drinking and everything else. I, th I think again, but this is dynamic storytelling and i think this is beyond what bethesda is capable of doing i mean based on their current trajectory they're more focused on dumbing down the actual interaction that the player has with npcs to the extent that 
essentially it's just the player and a basic world. They're there to experience the vistas. They're there to go into a cave and explore a dungeon. They're not yeah. there to actually change the world around them in terms of making decisions that have consequences, which is the whole basis of a role-playing game. Yeah. And this is what, I mean, this is a, um, in terms of game mechanics, that's a designed choice with Bethesda games. But in terms of, but I'm just basing the stream more on what the implications are of the politics of the various factions. And I've had to go into all of these uh, <laughs> changes with the games because it's simply to compensate for the fact that um, I don't believe there is sufficient depth there. And um, Nathan is saying, you know, it's a, a chance to sort of explore nationalism. And yes, I agree with you though, it's, it's simplistic. And like I said, it's not even really nationalism. It's yeah. nationalism in a sense, it, it's basically, a contest of taking over the position of headmanship of men against a potential war of elves. That's fundamentally what they're fighting over. They're not fighting over, I want Skyrim to be left alone. That's not an option when you're yeah. fighting for the Stormcloaks. That's not an option when you're fighting for the Empire. You're always faced with this option that there is inevitably going to be a war of the Thalmor. So the, my entire sort of problem with here is that all the conflict, all of it is just serving as a proxy for the bigger conflict that doesn't take place in the game, which is the conflict against the Thalmor. Now that could be interesting if it were better developed, but unfortunately it isn't. Yeah. So ultimately, towards the end, you're left with virtually the identical result. <laughs> the yeah. only sort of option you can really take is the option I you know, took the last time I played this game years ago, is just not to get involved. You know, be the Dragonborn and then um, assume in your head cannon that if you really had freedom of action in this game, and if there really were, if there really was a world that responded to your actions, then all you would say at one point when you've reached something like, I don't know, level 80, um, you would just decide, that's it, I'm going to become emperor. There's nothing stopping me. Yeah. No one, of, none of you can defeat me. And I've regardless built up enough clout where surely you should be supporting me now. Because to me, that is the only logical decision <laughs> that the Dragonborn could ever take. I'm not going to reach level 80, defeat everyone, and then I'm going to join as, a, um, as an auxiliary in either of these two pointless factions fighting a pointless war. <laughs> I mean, the, you, you can get a shout where you can summon dragons, like... Multi, like you, you can, like, yeah, I mean, you can, you can ride on dragons. I yeah, mean, I, you, can, you can basically, you know become a dragon in many sense with one of the shouts as well i mean you can yeah. do pretty much anything towards yeah, like, the end you're just, invincible just, and yet you're still <laughs> deciding whether you should support this random yarl or the local representative for the imperial legion in skyrim it just seems that at the end of this conflict the actual conflict between you know um stormcloaks and imperials just seems so insignificant yeah I mean, this is why mods, um, like game expansion mods, are so good. There's one, there's one called Rigmore, where you, where you basically, basically, what happens is, you your your character just just uh, I think your character marries a uh, the the Duchess of Bruma and just goes, yeah, now I'm I'm the emperor now, and you just sort of like roll up into the Imperial Council and you can you can murder just murder all the Imperial Councillors and. All the bureaucrats. <laughs> um, yes, and I think that's uh, that's the canonical way that this ends, and it's really the only way. That's the only um, way that it, it ends. ends. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think that's that's really all I can say about the politics. I was thinking about bringing up a point about the uh, the orc strongholds, and the only thing I will bring up about them. I mean, it gives the orcs a tiny bit of flavour, which was completely absent in Oblivion, apart from their worship of Malakath. So. But that, again, that's a, a neat addition, the fact that they have their own little strongholds and they have their own legal systems. And, you know, they have, you know, one one uh, ruler takes all and has all the wise and stuff like that. That's a, a neat little addition. But like I said, it uh, it's not developed in the same way that it really translates into many quests. Yeah. So that's yeah. the last thing I really want to say, if that's okay on the street. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. That's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, the Orcs, very interesting. Um, Orsin Orsinium. Um, I mean, I hope they explore that going forward because it's their homeland which has been destroyed and it's not recognised um, as a separate pr province in in the empire or anywhere else. So yeah, that'd be an interesting thing to to follow through on um, Bethesda to go forward with. Um, I mean, no, I think 
that was it as well. I mean, um, I think one of the problems, and I, I had a feeling this might would happen, was because well, people want to talk about that sort of nationalist elements and the, the politics of it. But the problem is, is that a lot, as we mentioned, the, the nationalist stuff doesn't make sense because in, in many ways, if you are you a nationalist for Skyrim or are you a nationalist for like the, the racist of men on on Tamriel and and if you were a genuine nationalist who was that you're a Nord or any um like or Breton or what have you your position would be well I'm just going to support um I, I'm going to try and keep like me, all, all the races of men together just to fight the elves because it's quite obvious what's you know as we say what's happening they're trying to you know with Hammerfell they're trying to break away all uh piece by piece all sorts of potential alliance uh going forward to uh in and also to to sort of weaken the empire to the point where um you know it's it to, well to the point where it is now where it, i mean reality the empire doesn't really exist it's it's, it's like a it's just a it's just a you know, vassal state um, exactly i mean i mean the, this this of anything should explain how superficial the conflict is if i'm a player who wants men not to be ruled by elves and i want men to worship talos then it doesn't even matter whether i support the imperials or whether i support the storm cloaks the question simply becomes a matter of immediate strategy and tactics hmm. do i want it all now or do i want to wait and be patient about it because that's basically the option they give you in the game and that's basically the policy that's the fundamental difference between tullius and ulfric and like I said, I have no vested interest in making Ulfric of all people the king of Skyrim. So, yes, I really think that's all there really is to say on this topic. Yeah, I think so as well. I mean, it's it's um, it's um, I mean, it's a shame. I imagine um, you it's a, it's a shame because if you were um, about probably about a uh, hold on a sec, I'm just going to. Uh, here we go um it's it's a shame because if you were present um a few years ago we we did a stream on on fallout new vegas and um uh with a, a couple of a couple of pals who who aren't uh, who are not on youtube anymore but um we um we we managed to do a pretty good breakdown of like the ncr and such and um looking at even the NCR, which you, which you could argue is like um, the most morally bankrupt of of all of them, um, still they were consistent in what they wanted, which was the you know, gradual expansion um, into Nevada. Um, there was a clear goal, you know, and it wasn't sort of contradictory um, at all. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and um, but no, um, I think uh, uh, I think that's the no one's really uh, got anything else. I've just I've, I've I'm looking at chat now. Um, oh, I was gonna say, am you excited for the rings rings of power video game that will yes. actually come out? Yeah, well, uh. Uh, as for the Rings of Power TV series, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm naturally excited. I've already got my um, my bunting out to celebrate when the day comes, and uh, I've got all my uh, cardboard cutouts of the person of colour dwarf queen um, yeah. already around my, uh, my my house. So yes, it's going to uh, to look appropriately exciting, and uh, I'm definitely looking forward to this diverse, inclusive, and equitable iteration of. Tolkien, because Tolkien simply needs to be adapted for modern audiences and modern times. And all I can say is, finally. Very good, very good, sir. And um, we, thanks to the Ring of Power, we um, might see some drive-bys in, in the Shire. And crime wave go up, and uh, crime wave go up by seventy percent. Um, yeah, um, yeah. On that note, um, I think uh, it's probably time to go to bed. Actually, I'm getting a bit tired myself. 
Um, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, AM, for for coming on and um, and uh, chatting about this. I think it. I think it was actually quite a good one because we've we we did actually touch on some. I mean, there was there are some parts of Elder Scrolls which are quite interesting. It's it's just when you go back you know, previous games um, that you actually have a more um, fleshed out um, world. I think, yeah, stuff like from Morrowind and and Oblivion. Um, but um, you know, I, I I think I think we sort of got at the root of of um, you know the Skyrim Civil War, and, and basically it's it's kind of like. Well, neither side makes sense, and, ne and neither side is. Uh, you know, ultimately, in, in both scenarios, the old Mary Dominion wins. You know, if you think about it, um, or well, they did win. You know, they, they won from you know, the, the start, the start during the Great, the Great War. So, um, yeah, that that's sort of my take on this. <laughs> um, so yeah, anyway, I, I thank you everyone for watching, and I bid you a good night. Uh, is there anything you want to promote, AM, before we go? uh no not really but i just want to say again thank you for having me on no that's great and thank you nathan hood for um sort of coming up with this idea and and sort of um uh bringing bringing everyone together for this because i think it was uh um it was on your on your one of your streams that uh we, we sort of engaged on this and it's um it's it's definitely be interesting to look at um and um you know it's um uh I definitely like to do sort of like <laughs> looking at politics, maybe like another sort of you know, other franchises um, uh, uh, beyond Skyrim and, and the Elder Scrolls. Uh, maybe do like a Fallout, uh, Fallout One or something like that. Uh, but definitely, anyway. Thank you, Am, for coming on, and thank you for watching. And uh, I bid you all good night.